everyone. Welcome to Rock Hound Talk Live, the only live Rock Hound podcast on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. I am your host, Amber Nicole, and this is my co-host, Ben Corn. Hey, Ben. Hey, Amber. How's it going? Good. Doing really good. Had a great weekend. Yeah, you seem to <laughs> be traveling a lot. You did a bunch of rock adventures, it looked like. Um, well, it was um, it was one. It was two great days, but it was one location. Um, I went down to Georgia. So it was really my, this is my first like long uh, road trip, uh, rock hound road trip. It was the first for the 2024 season. And it was the first one I did with my little, just me and him. So it was, it was extra special. And um, so we went down to Georgia. I had a friend um, who had some land down there who had never like did any like major like excavating actually none he hadn't done any just surface collecting and maybe just like digging in the dirt um, with shovels or something but nothing major and has just found enough crystals on the surface to to be curious about like what's underneath and like oh my god <laughs> what Is there a lot oh my god it's more than a lot it's like an <laughs> understatement it's like it's you know it's really hard to say it's it reminds me i know these are totally different crystals different geology land but it reminded me a lot of dirty diamond diggers how like you know just their backyard and then they have just this crazy alluvial deposit of herkimer diamonds so um that's what uh, ron brown um he lives in uh oak or his properties in oglethorpe i think it's i don't know if I'm saying it right county in georgia and um, so there is crystals in that area and amethyst and stuff. Um, but like what we were finding just on the very superficial layers was just, it was like crystal after crystal. I mean, they were everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it was insane. And then we finally, um, I got down deeper um, with the excavator. It was just like the, these crystal clusters, so large, just very beautiful. And we hadn't like reached any um, amethyst, which we were, they was kind of hoping because he found some on the surface. So it's definitely there. I mean, he found some on the surface. There's definitely some underneath. So that's, it's very exciting for him because his life just like literally changed in one weekend. You know, he went from, you know, Jeez. not really knowing it, it, he's finding crystals around his backyard to like literally having a mine. And like now it's going to have people like coming there to mine crystals. And, um, you know, we had Amos there. Um, mm, so yeah invited Amos and that was super cool just to meet, you know, a rock hound legend and listen to him, you know, explain, you know, geology of the area and like his, um, what's that, that kind of, uh, what did he call that, that he had the, where he could remote viewing. Oh yeah. 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 And like, did he, you did know, he do he, that? Yes, he did. It was really cool to see. It was really neat. And then, you know, like him and Brian go way back. So Brian um, um, ended up coming. And so just to see their, um, their bond and their like connection with digging, it was just really cool. I mean, it was a really cool weekend. And I had planned this gathering maybe like three and a half months ago. And it wasn't, first of all, we didn't even think we were going to find like a bunch of crystals. We just thought we would just walk around the property and just find stuff and just hang out as a gathering. And then it to turn into this, it was like, it was so cool. I felt so blessed to be there. Um, so we did that Saturday and Sunday. And then on my way home on Monday, I stopped by to see Chase in his place. So it was a fun weekend. Nice. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So I know you've got some stuff to show us. Yes. So I guess I'll kind of set it up so yeah. i had to go up to duluth superior region yes um, i seen your post yeah for for work so i it was one of those like i'd have to go up and then it was actually really nice because i would only have to do like an hour or two of work um so it's like i drive all the way up there a couple hours of work and then i would have time to do whatever go home you know whatever so i decided a couple times to stay up there so i actually met up with someone uh the first day up there and mm -hmm. we went on like um, another rock hound yes yeah oh, okay um bob wright who you might know oh yeah and bob so we went um he knows of a place that there is fluorite that you can find yeah. and, and they're not big crystals at all they're really small but most people don't even know that you can find it on the north shore lake superior so we like, like on up, the shoreline you can find it well, in that area, yeah. Oh, so okay, I mean, that gotcha. whole area, you know, like near near the shoreline. Okay, um, gotcha. So we went up 
the you know up you know along like superior and he took me you know all right we're gonna go this you know secret spot kind of a thing and we ended up finding it and it's like just one little area um that it's there and while we were going there we were walking past some areas where there's some calcite um and there's just these big like holes and a lot of them have been mined out and people have gone in there and taken stuff and we went past one of them and i was like there's there looks like there might be some good crystals in here he's like oh no there's better stuff ahead so we like kept going and i actually went to a different spot the second day i was up there and then the third day while i when i had to go up there i was like let me just go back in that area and just yeah. kind of walk around maybe there's stuff in the woods like you know i'm just gonna explore um so i walked back um let me see so this was the hole i had started mining away some stuff at the time um and there's actually in the bottom left hand corner is like a plate that i was like working so, on to get out real quick so is this like um kind of explain that this kind of area here is, is is this like a big boulder like what what are we looking at like yeah here? so this is like a cliff face so oh, cliff. there's okay, a lot there of so this is part of the um north shore volcanic system i think it's called so this is all old volcanic rock from the failed rift system of lake superior so like so, it's actually, yeah yeah so there's rhyolite and there's also a bunch of basalt okay. um a lot of this is like the host rock for the lake superior agates that people find uh, but you can find other stuff. Um, it's really interesting because there's actually some parts of it you can actually kind of match with like the Upper Peninsula of Michigan because it was like a rift system. So some yeah. of it was kind of the same. Um, but this was the pocket that I found. And I I mean, this took me three hours <laughs> of pounding <laughs> hard rock to get into this and pocket you, and get crystals. You probably didn't have like the right tools that you probably needed for that. You probably would have you probably would have chosen different tools right because you probably no, weren't I, thinking oh, no okay. i so i kind of knew like what's maybe expect so i had like okay. a chisel and a mini okay, sledge and like i okay, kind of knew what sledge. was going okay, on okay yeah because i i'm the one that's notorious where i just always have my my geo hammer and i'll oh, yeah. find something like that and i'll only have a geo hammer and i'm like oh my god like it, it, it never fails i just needed to carry the little sledge with me so so that's yeah. good you were prepared yeah, yeah. The only thing that I wasn't prepared for was I did not think I was going to find this much. So I didn't have like I had to take my sweatshirt off to like wrap up some of the crystals and not all of them I could wrap up. So trying to get back to the car, some of them got damaged. Um, but so this was like the hole and I started excavating away. And then these are all some right. of the crystals. Nice. So the one on the right, um, which I have another picture that kind of shows a little bit better, but one of the calcite crystals broke. And you can kind of see some dark red sort of in the middle uh -huh. of the one on the right. And then there's actually some black kind of to the left of it. That mm -hmm. is all inclusions inside the calcite. Ooh. So given that it's such an iron rich area up there, I am assuming it's hematite. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the black is. It could be, I mean, it could just be manganese. I'm not even sure. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, so this is another <gasps> photo. Oh, nice. So look at that response all, yeah, yeah so this is all cleaned up and it is like there's like these phantoms of the calcite and then mm -hmm. these hem hematite inclusions it's really interesting i was reading up about the area and they were saying that i mean some of these rocks are a billion years old so yeah. they've had multiple like events of calcite formation in some of these pockets and so these are like different events that have yeah, just yeah, built yeah. on top of it um, so it's really interesting. So and then the photo on the right, it was actually from a different pocket, but in the same area that I had already taken some photos of, but it's got a really great UV response. Yeah, All of these I pulled out of this pocket have a red, the red color. Um, so the the white the, is, oh, I know what the white is. That's probably the, the part that was exposed to light, the calcite that was exposed to light. It, it might have been. I actually don't I think, know. Cause like, I, I pulled... I, cause what happens to mine, at least in my area, like um, anytime, like actually the calcite that I just extracted last time we were talking, if it was an area that was exposed to the light, that area will be essentially white. Like that's like almost bleached when it's under UV. And then the part that was covered is like at that super vibrant color. So mm. I, I would imagine that that's probably... The part that was out was it was any of it exposed to the the sun well so this this was from a different pocket so the stuff oh. that i pulled out which i didn't take any of the uv photos none of it like all of it is red okay um so it's it's really great and the weird thing about this is like going through some of the chemistry and mineralogy of fluorescence 
they've mentioned like people have mentioned that iron is supposed to be like a quencher and gets mm -hmm. rid of the fluorescence like okay everyone thinks that rubies will fluoresce well there's actually rubies from madagascar that have such high iron content that they won't fluoresce okay so usually when there's iron it won't fluoresce which is well, odd these because have... they're full of iron yeah and there's there's like hematite inclusions in these crystals and they're still fluorescing red so cool. I don't fully know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah. Oh, and this gorgeous. is so this is one yeah. little plate. It actually did break, not the big crystal, but the bottom of the plate actually broke a little bit. Um, and you know, this was, you know, cleaned up. So you can see it's it's like brown in a lot of spaces after it's cleaned up. Um, I don't want to try to do like iron out or anything because it's calcite. Yeah, right. But right. Um, yeah, so I found some amazing crystals. I yeah. was like so happy to be like yeah. up there for work and like I'm you know, happy like, for you because you're like an agate guy. So when you get crystals, it's like <laughs> extra special for you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was like, you know, like and everyone, you know, like, you know, going in the area and then there's like people walking, you know, on the beaches and everyone looks for agates. And it's weird too, like in Minnesota, because there's so many other things. Like you can find like Datalite, Thompsonite. Um, a whole bunch of other stuff that aren't agates, but everyone only looks yeah. for agates. So if you do like find other stuff, like a lot of people just don't know and they just walk right past it. Yeah. So that means there's a lot of good stuff up there that no one's looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was, I just so that was, I was really oh, happy sorry, with, with, you know, being able to do, you know, rock counting basically with my yeah. mileage and everything paid for with work. It was great. So real quick, I'm just going to do a shout out to some of the people that have are joining us. We've got Papa Gems. Uh, we've got Armand, Mike. Hey, actually, Mike, I'm just going to put this up there. Um, Amber owes me a secret location. Yes. So the 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 pocket that I got to that, that calcite crystal that I showed like with Amos say, two weeks ago, I did get that location thanks to Mike. Good looking out, Mike. I appreciate that. We, I do owe you a secret location. <laughs> Um, so that's funny. So yeah, well, so two, we've had both had two, uh, great, uh, rock count experiences on the, the last few weeks. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah. And one, one other thing I wanted to mention, yeah. um, oh, yeah, but the Lord tones. Yeah. We sometimes yeah. talk about like rock hounding news. Um, and this has been like all over. Um, I just kind of heard like rumors about it and like, I still like haven't seen like an official announcement from Lord tone. But apparently Lortone is, um, I think they're trying to sell their business, but in respects to like everything, they're basically going out of business, um, which is wow. crazy. Yeah, crazy. Because they, they're always the brand that like, if someone's like, what Tumblr do I get? Yeah. It's like Lortone, like they last forever. They're great. Um, so I know there's a bunch of other like Tumblr companies Tumble trying B. to come in. Is it Tumblebee's kind of one that's, that's kind of peaking up there, right? Yeah, Tumblebee is like a newer one. Um, I believe um, uh, um, Diamond Pacific might be making okay. oh, one really? now too. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so there's like new, like some of the companies are sort of like they kind of started to have um, tumblers. And then this is complete rumor. Someone told me it's not true because they talked to an employee at the store, which uh -huh. I don't know how accurate that is. But someone said that they heard a rumor. So this is all gossip. Can't say if it's true or not, but Harbor Freight might be discontinuing their tumblers, which I know some people gravitate towards because they're on the cheaper end, but they're not like National Geographic where they're plastic and like super cheap. Um, so don't know if that's true or not. Um, the person that I heard it from said they tried to get more information, but couldn't mm -hmm. find any actual information. So mm -hmm. um, there might be some big kind of shakeup in the well, or this is an opportunity for somebody to create mass produce and create, you know, a Tumblr. You know, it would be great if a rock hound could come up with something really great and, and get that going. It's an opportunity for someone out there. So, yeah. Could yeah. And there's, it, there's a bunch of stuff right now. It seems like kind of post COVID, like I've seen, I know of someone actually in Minnesota that's looking to sell a rock shop. Um, and I saw an ad in like Rock and Gem that there's someone I think in Canada that is trying to sell like a full rock shop, like the building, the inventory, everything. So like, there's just, it just seems like it's just like this time where like people are either like, I'm going to retire and take a break or people are like, I'm going to like do something and like, you know, they've got momentum and they're going to, you know, pick up something or, you know, start something cool. So a lot of um, changes. Yeah. Yeah. And it might just yeah. be spring. Who knows? 
So I just want to real quick. Um, where did this? This is cute. I like this joke. <laughs> it ain't pocket science. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's a good geology joke. It's a good rock on joke. <laughs> That's cute. Uh, okay, so we have an exciting guest tonight. Ben, would you like to introduce our new guest? Yes. So our guest tonight is Chase Pipes. Um, if you don't know him, he is a historian. Um, he's a rock hound, fossil collector, all the things of digging in the dirt. Um, he's also the owner of the Smoky Mountain, Smoky Mountain Relic Room, uh, which is in Tennessee, um, which is a great um, wow. rock shop, um, artifact shop, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and if you want to see more, he does a bunch of YouTube videos called uh, Chasing History. Um, so you can check him out there. But uh, let's talk to him about all that. So welcome, Chase. Yay, hey, guys. Yay, how are you? Hey, how are you? Good. Thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on and share your journey with everyone. And uh, let's just start with telling us, when did you discover that you had uh, a passion and love for history or history related items? Like, when did that start for you? <laughs> so where I, I grew up on uh, English Mountain in Sevier County, Tennessee. And at the, at our house, we had a little garden. Well, I found an arrowhead in the garden. And that just, I was about five years old. I was so excited. I went and showed my dad. He was like, oh, it's great. Go find another one. I went and I found another one. And so then my dad got me a subscription to the Central States Archaeological Journal. They still exist to this day. And, and quarterly, I would get this archaeology magazine. And I would, you know, this little five-year-old, it came in the mail with my name on it. I got a little, you know, That's card cool. that says member. I mean, I didn't have, I mean, I didn't have any money in my wallet, but man, I had a wallet with that membership card in it. <laughs> so ever since I was a kid, I mean, I've just been obsessed with it. other kids, nerded out on baseball cards and comic books. And dude, I nerded out on archaeology and rock handing journals and stuff like that. So ever since I was literally just about walking i've been fascinated about about history you know more specifically not just the the human history of the place but the geolo geologic history of the place you know being able to stand on a place and look and to see in your mind's eye everything that happened on that spot from human history to geology all of it it just it fascinates the heck out of me i mean yes. how could that not be how could you not want to not know that right I mean, exactly it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's so cool. So ever since I was a kid, I've been into it. Um, and then uh, my dad was involved in the um, in the artifact world as a dealer mm -hmm. kind of on the side. So as a kid, I would go to shows and stuff okay. and, and um, learn kind of the, the trade of the artifact world. Um, and then when I was in my early 20s, I started doing some fossil hunting. I hooked up with some fossil hunters and man, that was like a whole freaking other awesome window. And so I'd started nerding out on fossils and crystals and minerals. And, and uh, so I built the relic room and everything in between. But that's it all starts from when I was a little kid finding an arrowhead. And that's that's why it's so important for people to go out and find actually find stuff, because okay. that's what in, it gets you having the thing in your hand and finding it yourself. That's what inspires mm -hmm. you. That's what yeah. gets you excited about, you know, history in the past, whether it's geology or, you know, or archaeology. Finding right. that thing is so important. And it what's really wild is. is, is here in the United States, we're kind of the last one of the last bastions of, you know, citizens who can go out and collect stuff. Cause in a lot of countries you cannot collect fossils. So crystals and minerals. Yeah. That's a little bit more lax, but as far as fossils and artifacts in other countries, you can forget it. We're, we're pretty much it. So, wow. so I, I've got a question kind of going back. Cause I think I read, um, so your dad was selling artifacts and then he was doing something with knives, like kind of on the side. Yeah. So, um, so Smoky Mountain Knife Works is our family business. Dad started that out. He actually started that business uh, out of what what was the infant relic room back in the seventies. 
So the knives did better than the artifacts did. So he shelved the relic room business. And uh, when we built on the new addition to our store in 2008, uh, you know, we took that relic business and gave it a storefront for the first time in 30 years. And so I oversaw and managed that storefront. The only thing that we had at that time was a few military artifacts and some prehistoric artifacts. That's it. We uh, maybe a couple fossils. And so that's when I started hooking up with, um, you know, guys that people that make a living rock counting or people that make a living digging dinosaurs or people that make a living metal detecting for artifacts. You know, I would hook up with all of these different people in all these different communities. And if I saw something interesting, I'd either stuff I was finding or stuff they were finding, I would purchase and we would add it to the relic room. And eventually it grew and grew and grew. And then a couple of years ago, I bought the business from him. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's where it started. So the knife works is within our family, family business. My younger brother actually runs it now. So, and, and just so people know, this isn't like a small store. You've got <laughs> like waterfalls. I think it's what, like 110,000 square feet or something like that. Yeah. Somebody should stop us. They're not stopping <laughs> us. It's like we, well, so we've always been history minded. I mean, you know, my dad was, you know, he started out in the artifact world long before he ever did the knives. So he had a, a history mindset. So when we built the knife works originally, uh, you know, we put, you know, stuffed animals all uh, and only crazy exotic species and we, these really cool history displays and and just all this neat stuff on the wall that was just to look at, not for sale. And then you can look at the stuff on the wall, but if you want to shop, you can shop also. And so, yeah, right now the store is 110,000 square feet. Uh, the It encompasses three different businesses. So you've got the Knife Works, then you've got Smoky Mountain Guns and Ammo, which is my little brother's business. And then you've got Smoky Mountain Relic Room, which is mine. And so they're all kind of three under under that roof. But yeah, it's 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 not all. Yeah, there's two waterfalls, two creeks running through it. There's displays everywhere. It's just it's a it's a freaking madhouse, man. And then you've got, you know, the relic room and all of its diversity. You know, it's yeah. like I said, man, nobody's stopping us. It's like we think it's cool. We're going to do it cool. and put it in the shop either. It's like those the 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 crystal, uh, the am two amethyst cathedral entrance, uh, a buddy of mine, Richard, um, who digs for amethyst down in Brazil. That's what, that's what he does. He had these, this giant freaking pair and I was at Tucson and he offered it to me for a stupid cheap price. I'm not going to say what, but it was, it was dumb how cheap it was. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, if I get it, I can't ever sell it because I can't put it in anybody's car. You know, they're 15 <laughs> feet tall. Yeah, they're so it's like, well, I guess I'll get it and put it on display. So that's a lot. That's how a lot of the neat stuff that's in the shop gets in there. It's just, you know, man, I think people would really enjoy seeing that. And so and where we'll, else are they going to see something like that, like in person, you know, like that's really cool just to be like, I, you didn't mm. see it online. Like you got to see it in person. Like it, it totally sure. resonates differently. Like I, I had never seen anything like that until I got there. And then it's just like, oh, this is cool. It's even cooler. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's a total experience. It's like I said, it's kind of a, it's a museum that you yeah. can come in and look around or it's a museum that you can, you can buy from. And yeah. so in there's news. So we build the relic room as the largest diversity of history for sale anywhere in North America. And we can't find another store that has the diversity that we have. Uh, Cause we have everything in geologic history going back to, you know, literally the the oldest the fossil fossil yeah that ever ever actually it was until like last year i think last, last year, year it yeah. got dethroned but it's literally the oldest fossil known to science a buddy of mine uh tom capitana from uh crystal world he lobbied the australian government for like 20 years to be allowed to collect this for sale for the public and the government allowed him to go to this site, North Pole Dome in Australia, collect a, a handful of it. He was only allowed to do it one time. And we bought some of those fossils. So this is it's literally the microbial map, the single cell bacteria that all life sprang from. This is that fossil. And so, so cool. we start there. <laughs> You can, you, we've got some for sale. So we you start, start there, at the beginning of life and go right. all the way up <laughs> and go all the way up to the cold war. We've got cold war military artifacts. We, we had some, uh, 
Iraq War military artifacts once, uh, some soldier bringbacks, so, and everything in between, Roman, Viking, Celtic, all your famous cultures, prehistoric Stone Age cultures going back to uh, the early man stuff, the, the tools that were made by Homo Neanderthalus, Homo habilis, ho early Homo erectus, uh, early Homo sapien, the, the tools that were made by species of humans that, you know, are extinct, you know, but made tools, we have their tools. You so, can, for no joke, for 20 bucks, you can pick up a, 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 a tool made by a species of human that's extinct, uh, the hand axes. That is so crazy. I just, you know, the fact, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned that when, when I did a tour this week with you, is that, like, how important it is to you that people learn and appreciate history, and part of that is being able to, like, we'll talk about ownership and your view on that. Um, but to be able to afford to have something like that, because in most places to have something like that would be an astronomical amount. So I, I think that is awesome. And I, and I, and I, I, you know, to, to, to think that you have that kind of model is, is just, it's just, I, it's just, it's just even, I can't even put words on it, you know, well, to think well, that the, way. The thing that I, the truth of the matter is, is that artifacts aren't rare. Crystals and minerals are not rare. Fossils are not rare. This stuff isn't rare. Right. There, where you go to places where you can find fossils, they're they're freaking everywhere. Now, there are rare species. There are rare crystals and minerals, and there are rare artifacts. But the common stuff is abundant. You know, human beings have only been collecting, you know, crystals and minerals and artifacts and stuff for about 200 years. You know, you don't hear about medieval guys going out and rock hounding. You know, they just they didn't do that. You know, it wasn't until the 18th century, the age of the Enlightenment, where, you know, people started trying to figure out how the world works, that they started collecting things in order to figure out those geological processes or those historical processes. So collecting is, is still a relatively new thing. Um, but this stuff is abundant and out there and you shouldn't have to be some rich dude up on a hill to be able to have a really cool piece of history, whether it's an awesome piece of natural history, like a cathedral or a cool crystal or a really cool piece of human history, like an early man hand axe or a Roman coin. It shouldn't cost And it absolutely forgive the expression. It pisses me off. I don't know if yeah. I can say that or not, yeah, you but it, it does. People have it, said it, far worse. You're, you're okay. All right. It does, dude. <laughs> dude, it, fuck, it pisses me off. You go into rock shops or you go into, you know, history shops and they're like charging like a hundred bucks for a stupid Roman coin that you should be able to get for five, you know, and, and the markup in the crystal in their world is absurd. It's, yeah, it's, it it's criminal. So I don't play any of those games. It's just, you know, we've got a really simple formula. You know, we, we, when we purchase something, you know, we, we increase it by a certain percent and go on. Because everybody should be allowed to afford this stuff. I mean, they're, I here's, like I said, none of it's that rare. And human beings have made more things in our history than all the museums in all the world can hold. Okay. They're, they, the museums cannot hold every arrowhead ever made, every fossil that ever fossilized, every crystal or mineral that ever grew. So it's up to the public to take care of this stuff. And, and when you purchase something, you're paying for the right to have the responsibility to take care of it. You don't own it because right. you're going to die, but it's still going to be here and it's still going to, you know, carry on. And its job is to tell us the story of the history that it witnessed. So when you pick up something, you're 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 paying for that responsibility to take care of it and to ensure it's uh path down the generations so and and you're going to make sure like collectors are really particular they really make sure that stuff is cared for and when it's time it gets passed on to the next person yeah. so 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 i i've i've watched some of your videos and it kind of like strikes me that you know so much about so many things because i've seen you talk about like the civil war um, I was reading you did uh, Revolutionary <laughs> War reenactments. Um, you're That's my one of the few people that I've seen just like rattle off dinosaur names. Like you just know it in the back of your head. And like, even as a geologist, I'm like, I, I don't know, like yeah. T-Rex. Um, so like <laughs> with all this stuff. And then um, I think I saw you, you went to college for a couple years and didn't finish. 
but like how how did you learn all this was just this like osmosis of being around people that know stuff or do you just like dive into books and just study like certain topics or like how did you get all this knowledge well first off the, the reason why i i do what i do and i'm interested in what i'm interested in is because i love to learn and I, I, I've got so much to learn. And that's what makes it fun and interesting is, is that, you know, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff, but I still have so much to learn. And I love surrounding myself with people who are experts in those specific fields, because then I can sit down and nerd out with them and just ask a billion questions and continue to learn. But I went to college. I wanted to be a college level history professor. That's what I wanted to do. But math, I can't do math. I just, my brain does not work that way. It's like, I'm sorry. And I, I literally could not pass the math classes. I tried so hard for like two years and there just wasn't, it wasn't happening. So I dropped out and uh, went to work, you know, with my family in the business. And then the relic room popped up and went that direction. So, uh, but I, 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 my thing is, is I, I'm interested in everything. I want to know I want to know everything. I want to yeah. learn about everything. It's like uh, the paranormal is a big interest of mine uh, because I see it as an emerging science. So there's so much to learn about this world and this universe. And history is a great place to look. So I find something that I'm interested in and I just I dive in. I read everything I can get my hands on. I listen to every documentary, every book I can get my hands on. And then I go out and I meet the people who, who focus in that field. And I talk with them. I nerd out with them. I'll go out and I'll dig with them and I'll just learn as much as I can. You don't have to, you shouldn't have to go. You don't have to go to college in order to learn. And because you're out of high school doesn't mean you get to stop learning. That's right. what makes humanity awesome is yeah. because we can just learn for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool. And it we is. can learn brand <laughs> new things for I the rest it. of our lives. And it's so cool. And so I nerd out on learning and I'm I love really, it. really, I'm so fortunate and so blessed um, to have met and call friends, some of the greatest, some of the smartest people in these fields. I, I have got some incredible friends that are patient with me, that take their time to educate me. They're pro-education. Uh, a lot of them I've interviewed on, on my YouTube channel, uh, and they, they're passionate about it as well because they love to share the knowledge. And so I'm really blessed to have met some awesome, awesome people along the way. That's great. A lot, yeah. you know, I don't think any, I mean, your enthusiasm and passion is so infectious. Like you could literally turn somebody who doesn't care a lick about history and make them like it. I, 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 that is, I, 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 don't, I couldn't imagine somebody not listening to you and not liking history. It's not it, it, whatever aspect. Well, that's what that that's what I'm here for. You know, that's what I think I'm put on this earth to do. I'm here to get people excited about the past. You know, humanity uses tools like science and medicine and religion and government to better, you know, humanity. But the one tool we don't use is history. Now, just imagine. So mathematically, you neither of you will go through a situation in your life that hasn't already happened to somebody else. No matter what the situation is, there's been too many humans living too many lives. So imagine if you had a resource where you can type in, you know, I'm fighting with my wife or whatever today. We're having this problem. And there's a hundred examples of how people succeeded or how people screwed it up. And you can learn what to do and what not to do. That's what history is. But you're not going to get people, you know, to think that way, to use history as a tool if they're not interested in it. And the problem right. is our educational system. What I'd love to do with like the latter part of my life is help to revamp the entire American educational system because it's broken. <laughs> and history is a great example why. So history in, in our ed current educational standard, you have to be able to test people on their knowledge. That's how we know people are learning is testing on their knowledge. Well, the way that we do test is, is a written form, you know, questions, A, B, C, D. So then, all right, you've got a, a, a story. So you have to teach a story in a way that it can then be tested. And so that leads to learning names and dates. And it removes the story from history. 
So what I will try to do is, is bring the story back to it. Because, dude, Game of Thrones ain't got nothing on stuff that's actually freaking happened in human history. Like, dude, some stuff, it's, it's real things that have happened. And I think that, you know, if you can just, if I can just get people to think differently about history, then they'll be interested in it. And if they're interested in it, then they'll, you know, the, they'll learn from it. And, and also, so how do, how do you make the planet a better place? So, well, it's everybody taking care of the planet. That's going to do it. So how do you make people want to take care of the planet? Well, you get people excited about the history of their area. If people know the history of their hometown, they understand that story, that past, then they're going to they're gonna love it. If they yeah. love it, they're going to want to take care of it. And if they take care of it, they're going to see that it doesn't get overdeveloped, that it doesn't get polluted, that it gets taken care of. And it all starts with history. So I think that history can be one of these tools like science and medicine and religion and government that humanity uses to better ourselves. I see history as one of these tools that we're just not using. It's yeah, like we're it, trying to build a house with a rock and we've got this awesome hammer sitting there. And I'm saying right. pick up the freaking hammer. It's right. a good hammer and it'll teach you to not mess up. So Right, right, right. I mean, if you think about it like that, really, we don't. We really don't no. use history as a tool no. at all. No. Yeah. And and that's secretly, that's everything that I'm trying to do <laughs> is like, that's it. I'm trying to use what I have in order to get people excited about history. So through my store, I'm trying to offer people artifacts and fossils and minerals and meteorites uh, and get them into their hands. Well, how can I do that? Make it as affordable as possible. My hope is when they pick that stuff up, then they'll get excited about whatever they want to nerd out on and they'll start that journey to be interested in history. And then I can go and, and I can, you know, the relic room, you know, it, really is the funding for chasing history and I can go do what I want to do and that's dig stuff up and teach people yeah. about it. And then that way I can teach people about, about history in the past and get them excited about it. And hopefully that'll make the world a better place. So it's not, I know we talked a lot about, you know, the business and commercial stuff at the beginning of this, but that's not really what I'm all about. What I'm all about is, is trying to get people interested in, in history in order to make this a better place place to live on because I think that each one of us has something to contribute towards that end. And this is just what I have that I can contribute. So, yeah. Yeah. So with, with kind of that too, I know you've sent some photos that really show this. So I want to start going through some of the photos. Cause I feel like you're going to have just a ton <laughs> of just stories and just, things. yeah. Cause he's like, he's chased freaking pipes. Of course he's got stories. Hold on one second. This one down here is one of my favorites with the chick in the background. Yeah. So, all right, check this out. She's given. So, so this is back in April. This is with my buddy, Andreas Kerner. Uh, he's German living in America. We went to Germany, spent a month in Germany uh, filming for Chasing History. He got us access to like killer Roman sites. And anyway, we're in this awesome museum and we're filming for Chasing History. And it just happens to be school day. And so we're now bombarded with all these classes. And then this French class walks in. It's like, why, why? And so, and they are just being loud, and noisy, and blah, blah, blah. And so I was like, dude, take a picture of me just annoyed as hell over these <laughs> damn school kids. And so I did that. And then, like, uh, later that night, I was looking at the pictures. I was like, that fucking chick is thumbs up. What the hell? Oh, my God. That's great. So <laughs> that's one of my, my favorites. The that's ones cute. up above is, so that's my buddy Johnny Isa. Johnny's one of the owners of the Corite Amalite Mine. Uh, this past summer, Isaac, he invited Isaac and I up. Uh, that's my son in the middle, Isaac. Uh, he invited Isaac and I up to uh, film an episode of Chasing History on the Corite mine. So here in about a month, we'll have that episode dropped. And we show you how they mine amylite, why it's there. We did a great interview with the curator of paleontology at the Terrell Museum about amylite. Um, and so we're actually going back this summer to do an interview with the chief of the Canadian Blackfeet about amylite because to the Canadian Blackfeet, it's called, it's the Buffalo stone. It's a very sacred stone. So we're going to get that aspect, excuse me, of it as well. So that's what we're doing up there. And then the one where I'm holding the, the amylite, if you see all those little holes in it, those are Mosasaur bite marks. Whoa, so really? What they, wow. Yes. So they'll cool. find, 
So, so for the on the Ammonite real quick, this is a very concentrated find. Like it's only in this one spot. What they think is this was a breeding area, and they think that Mosasaurs kind of knew that these Ammonites would con or would congregate there. Th those are Ammonites. They're marine cephalopods, kind of like a, nautil a nautilus. Um, so anyway, what they would do is, is the Mosasaurs, they figured would bite holes into the gas chambers that would cause them to sink. And then they would swim down and would have a little snack. So that's yeah. what they think is going on there. So occasionally cool. they'll find, um, they'll find these amylites with bite marks in them. And that's one with bite marks in it. So it's a I pretty cool it. thing. You, you need to interview Johnny. He's man. He is like the nicest freaking god i love that man he is the nicest he's canadian so of course he's nice he's of course <laughs> of course yes he's be nice. um he's awesome they've got a cool site because that color is natural yeah. and reason why it's just this one spot on the planet that causes that and so this is found kind of in a valley and so what they think ha what what happened is is when the glaciers came down it put 15 miles of ice on top of this fossil bed and it created so much pressure that it rearranged the atomic structure there was so much pressure it changed the atomic structure of the shell to reflect the entirety of the light spectrum and that's, that's what crazy. gives it the colors that's why this side is the only one that has it because of that intense pressure so and and it's a mineral it's like the uh, it's yeah. it's a actually classified mineral it's the only thing i think that's classified as both a fossil and a mineral, a mineral yeah. so, so it's, i'm trying to think of the name of the mineral that it actually is things starts with an r uh, anyway but yeah it's a cool thing so that's those yeah. pictures okay and then these, <laughs> these are like some educational like yeah this is some educational stuff so the one i did a zoom class uh this is towards the end of covid um, I, I do a lot of uh, talks for schools and classes, so I love doing seminars and stuff like that. So this is a seminar for a uh, middle school in Middle Tennessee. And so basically where I showed them around the shop and just taught them about, you know, the history of life. You know, I, I do. I've got a couple of talks. One is like, you know, the history of the world in two hours. And then I've got one that's for Tennessee kids, like the history of Tennessee in two hours. And I'll go through like the geologic history and the dinosaurs and human history and all that. So that that was one of those classes. So <laughs> so the next one, I can't believe they. This is what I'm saying, dude. They're not stopping me. Like somebody <laughs> should stop me, but nobody's stopping. No, me. we don't want you to so stop. This is great stuff. <laughs> so I, I I had bought a collection, and in that collection was an old Victrola talking machine from 1915. It's actually see, it's actually right there in the house. That's that is that <laughs> machine. So it's a it's an old Victrola from 1915. I bought it in a collection, and with it was a bunch of records and stuff. And so I nerded out on this thing and I met a guy in South Carolina that restores them. I got him to restore it. So anyway, the, our, my podcast, it's uh, called chasing history radio is my podcast. And so it's live once a week on our local radio station. So I'm hanging out with two local radio DJs talking about history for 15 minutes and we try to keep it fun and funny. And so anyway, I was telling them about doing this and uh, Jay, one of the hosts, was like, "Well, why don't you bring the bring the Victrola down? We'll play it on the radio." And I'm like, "Dude, what? No! Are you, <laughs> wait a minute. Are you serious? I can bring this down and we can play this crazy thing on the radio?" He's like, "Yeah, sure." I was like, "Oh my god!" I was so freaking excited. So we brought the Victrola down. I, you know, did a thing on the history of the Victrola, and we played the Victrola on Sevier County's morning drive radio station at nine <laughs> o'clock in the morning, dude, we were playing, I mean, all kinds of crazy classic hits. Uh, the very first uh, blues uh, record that was ever recorded from the Dixieland jazz band. It's before jazz, not blues, but jazz. The very first jazz record ever recorded. We played that. Uh, cool. We play just, yeah. So anyway, so that's, I, I got to play a Victrola live on the radio. Probably the first time in 60 years since that's happened. Um, oh, so, yes. The, oh, the <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So the one on the on, on the left uh, is me. Doing, a buddy of mine has got a, uh, his dad's got a YouTube channel called the Appalachian Channel. If anybody likes Southern Appalachian history and, you know, uh, mountain history, it's an awesome, awesome YouTube channel. I 
definitely go check that out. So he was doing one on on us on the relic room. Uh, the next one next to that is a mammoth leg that I picked up that still has meat on it. And wow. so um, a buddy of mine had it. It came out of Siberia. So in the permafrost, so they, in Siberia, they're doing placer mining for mammoth ivory because elephant ivory is illegal. Mammoth right. ivory is it's still ivory. And so they actually mine for for mammoth ivory and they're using a placer mining technique where they're using these giant hoses to like blast the permafrost to side. Well, sometimes they find some crazy stuff like woolly mammoth hair. I was like, well, how can woolly mammoth hair exist? Well, woolly mammoths would shed their winter coat every spring and you get these big giant massive mats of hair that would go into a boggy area and then be frozen and be permanently frozen for, you know, 20,000, 30,000 years until these guys blast it out and find it. So, uh, sometimes they'll actually find, you know, whole animals, like not just mammoths, but dire wolves and Arctic foxes and just cool stuff. Yeah. So this I, is a mammoth leg. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I actually heard about, um, it was a few weeks ago that I can't remember where it was, but it was, it was somewhere, you know, like Siberia or, or wherever. And someone had found this small ball of fur mm -hmm. and something about it just oh, like yeah. kicked yeah, yeah, them yeah, off yeah. and they were just like, there's something about this and they took it in and they like x-rayed it and it was like a like a really small like fox or something that they had like no one had like ever heard about before and it had like curled up like you know like they'll sometimes curl up into a little I think ball it was a squirrel i think it was a, wasn't it a squirrel or it, it might have been a squirrel it was like a squirrel yeah. or a fox or some yeah. kind of small animal like that and it had curled <laughs> itself up into a ball and then just gotten frozen in time literally yeah. well and then they just found it it was <laughs> yeah well, see, that's what happens at these sites. And, and here's the thing is, is that's not really a rare thing. You know, every couple, every year they find, you know, several parts of mammoths or several parts of some animal that was partially frozen that stayed partially frozen in the permafrost for all that time. So it kind of goes back to it, not everything's truly rare, but there are some rare things. So that's what this leg is. It's a leg that still has meat on it. And uh, I got me and two of my dino digging brothers. <laughs> I talked them into, I was like, wait a minute. I just bought a mammoth leg with meat on it. Oh I own God. a mammoth leg with meat on it. Oh my gosh. I can eat mammoth meat. <laughs> oh like, my God. So literally. I talked my two buddies into doing it. We filmed it. It's on our TikTok channel. Just go to Smoking Mountain Relic Room TikTok. You can see that. It's on our YouTube channel, Smoking Mountain Relic Room on YouTube. And we ate mammoth meat like not a little piece like we each got big pieces we had it tasted terrible we had the worst gas we've ever had that lasted like a week like our gut bacteria did not know what was happening and then when you came down Amber, okay like, yeah I was son, gonna say, like, my son <laughs> just ate a piece of that mammoth meat and um we were so like you know listen let me just tell you okay so you when get he superpowers did, so when we did it he i said you weren't scared he goes well I figured if he offered it to me, it wouldn't hurt me. And I was like, that's fair. And so he goes, so he goes, so he starts Googling, right? I said, honey, you're not, there's no evidence. There's no research on eating mammoth meat because we don't eat mammoth meat. And so he's like, do you think I'm going to be okay? I go, I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's good to know that you had a lot of bad gas so that if he, he does experience that like i'll be like oh it's just part of the process yeah you know, it's just part of the body. process <laughs> you got bacteria is like what is going, going on? on we'll deal with it so anyway so so that's a that's a mammoth leg with some with some of the muscle tissue still attached which is a really that's cool thing that's so one of those cool. things that are on display not for sale we do have some things that are you know that are just so cool we don't want to yeah. sell them we want a lot yeah. of people to see it and enjoy it because uh, we get a lot of people, we get a million and a half people coming through our store every year. That's and so, so cool. that's a lot of eyes that wouldn't normally get to see, you know, uh, something cool like that, that have the opportunity to see something cool like that. Yeah. And so, so Mike asked, um, he's eight and a half hours away <laughs> and he's planning to get there the middle of next week. And he's wondering if you need an appointment. No, not at all. I mean, we're, we're, um, nine to five business actually from 10 o'clock until six o'clock is our hours, seven days a week. Uh, you know, not, you know, we're not open for Christmas and Thanksgiving, of course, but we're open year round. 
Uh, so yeah. And, and I do, Mike, I promise you, it, it really is worth the drive. Like you'll, you'll, you'll be very oh, yeah. glad you came. Mike is, uh, I, I know Mike, we, we've, we've collected together. Mike is like huge into like fossils and, and history things. So oh, like, dude. He, he's going to fuck. He's, I mean, he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna wig out on this. Like he, He's totally going to go nuts, geek out. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going to go nuts. When you come through, say hello. Um, and we had one question just come in um, from number one billiard um, mentioning about Dr. Fisher from the U of M museum, um, who apparently is the lead paleontologist on most mammoth expeditions. And they're wondering if you've ever met him. I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, yeah. And just, you know, um, going through some of the other comments here. Um, yes. <clears throat> Amylite. Um, if you look up Amylite, that was the mineral um hello to flash in the pan and sues now um, on the amylite it's there's it that's like not it specifically the argonite mineral there's another mineral he was there, thinking I it was argonite oregonite yeah. oh, that's, that's it i, I think that's it but yes yeah it's something like that like oregonite okay we'll we'll look into that yeah, yeah, um, well, yeah, yeah, yes. Let Ben, you can confirm that for us as the geologist. Yes. <laughs> um, and we did have one other question from Mike, um, saying there's a secret Menard limestone formation for blastoid fossils in Lincoln County, Tennessee. Um, do you know it? I don't know of that. No, um, Tennessee's not really known for fossils. We've got, uh, even though we, we've got one of the greatest uh, Miocene sites in the world yeah, was discovered about 10 years ago in East Tennessee. That's a period of history where there's not a lot known. It's kind of just before the Pleistocene. It's, you know, four, three, four million years ago. And it's a complete, it's everything. It's everything from lichen to plants to lizards to bugs to, you know, large red pandas originated and, there. And, and that's that's, like, that's the, the, the gray fossil yep, site? Yep, Is that's that right? the gray fossil site. Yeah, so yeah, that's it, a private site, oh. and it's kind of a one-off kind of thing. It's a, it's like the uh, hot springs site, the mammoth site where all the mammoths are, where it's a, it's a fossilized uh, sinkhole. So it's kind of a one-off. Uh, we've got some is it Devo Devonian stuff up on the Cumberland Plateau, and the, or no, Ordovician stuff on the Cumberland Plateau, and then in Middle Tennessee. We've got the Coon Creek Formation, which is a, cr a Cretaceous marine deposit. Uh, and there has been some dinosaur stuff found there. There's actually a guy on Facebook I'm trying to connect up with who's actually really? been hunting for dinosaur stuff in Tennessee. What? And so, yeah, I know. I'm like, what? what? So it's like, I want to see what's going on here. So, yeah. But yeah, uh, I, I haven't heard of the blastoids that are found, but there, there's some cool fossils, you know, some early stuff that you can find in Tennessee. I, I will say if anyone is ever in the area, the gray fossil site is really yes. cool. And it's similar to the mammoth dig site where they were doing construction. They were trying to build um, an area for the road, either expanding it or something like that. And some, you know, construction guys hit some fossils and they were like, mm -hmm. you know, something doesn't look right, whatever. And they got people involved and more people looked at it. And it's, I mean, you go through it and they're like, yeah, we found like, the big like land sloths that are like 13 feet tall and like cave bears and all these like you know prehistoric rhino type things that were living in north america and these red pandas and and it's not just like they found red like pandas yeah, yeah red so pandas it's... originated in east tennessee yeah which what? is what? so cute, awesome they're cute, they're cute little ones yeah yes. they're like raccoons like yeah Wait, they're yep. not... how, how come they're in asia now Oh no! That we 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 pissed everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait! This is I did not know this. This is cool. Oh, yeah. Red yeah. pandas are from Tennessee. Yeah, that's their big claim to fame because it's the it's the earliest red panda that's ever been found. Wait, there wait, wait! So like, earlier. why isn't does it Tennessee like? Why, why isn't that like one of their like mascots or something like that's cool well, it's 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 on the u-haul bus like okay. occasionally you'll see you'll see like okay. the u-haul trucks okay. with like the gray with like a red panda on it and it's that's like, so you cool know? i never so, knew that the thing is is it's a, it's a one-off site so it's okay. not like we've got a major deposit it, it's just a it's a sinkhole and it's a light like you know uh like Ben was saying, it's like the mammoth, the hot springs mammoth site where you've got a fossilized water column. So basically you've got an old sinkhole that, you know, dried up, everything fell in, it dried up. As the millennia went, the hills around it 
uh, eroded away, leaving this water column intact as a hill. And when they cut a road through it, they whacked into all these fossils and brought oh, wow, the state yeah. in. And they were like, what the, what <laughs> this is, what? And wait, it wait, just wait. blew yeah. away Question. because it's from a period that scientifically we don't have a lot of sites from or when anywhere they, in the world. When did they like learn all this? Like how long ago? Oh, I think I think they found it around 15 years ago. And okay, I so it's fairly around, new. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, it's, it's fairly recent. And, and they they do um you can help volunteer. I know they were mm -hmm. looking for volunteers to like cuz what'll happen is they'll go through and they'll dig out some of the big fossils, but they'll keep the dirt and volunteers can come and help them like sieve through the dirt and find like the micro fossils, which are oh, important because you find so out a lot fun. more about the environments and things. But, you know, kind of going back to the thing about like, you know, <clears throat> certain things aren't rare or people think that they're super, you know, uncommon. Um, if you go through like the gray fossil site, they'll even mention like they have found like 13 of these like old like horse like looking things and a whole bunch of like other like they'll have like really Papers. cool ones on display but they have so many fossils yeah. um and they've got really cool you know windows into the prep labs and like yes the if, if you're in the area you know that's oh, that's okay, what i did cool. i had to go to bristol for work and it was i i busted my ass and finished early and i was like where am i gonna go i was like all right i'll go see the dolly parton statue and like what else i was like oh the relic room like there's a cool rock shop yeah. near there and then i was like oh there's this fossil site and yeah there's so much to do in that area that is you know oh so this just... area is kind of by the relic room yeah yeah it's not too far from the shop okay cool so east tennessee's got some cool history i mean you're talking one of the oldest mountain ranges on the planet is, is is the southern highlands of the Appalachian Mountains, the highest peaks on the East Coast, right there, yeah. uh, right where we're at. I mean, th those mountains were mountains before life existed, you know, when life, complex life was just getting started on land. I mean, that's how right. old those mountains are. Not only that, but there was a mountain range that existed on that spot going back a billion years before the Smokies were ever formed. So it's one of the only spots on the planet that I know of where for all all of known time, there have been mountains. So, mm. you know, a billion years ago, there was a mountain range. It completely eroded down. And 350 million range. years ago, the Appalachians formed and it's slowly eroding down. So wow. it's just when you come into Tennessee, man, it's just it, it's awesome. It's like you're walking into something ancient. I mean, it was the largest expanse of virgin forest east of the Rockies in the 1930s. And then they logged it and was like, now we'll make it a national park. But it, it's 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 just it's gorgeous. It's a cool area. It really is. Yeah. All right. So these uh, this was this past uh, February. This was the last big dig. Um, so we uh, a, a buddy of mine worked on a ranch in Arizona in the Oro Valley. And he was telling us about, you know, tripping over all these bombs. And we're like, what? What? <laughs> so we did some research and found out that this rancher, his great grandfather or whatever, leased out part of his ranch to the U.S. Army Air Corps as a practice bombing range. So what the Air Corps would wow. do is they would have these dummy shells. These are 100 pound, um, 100 pound. Uh, art not artillery, but 100 pound bombs that were dropped out of B-17s filled with sand. And what it was what it was was to teach bomber crews how to work together and teach the bombardier accurate target bombing. And so they would set up targets on the ground like, you know, cardboard trains and crap like that. And so they would drop these bombs. Well, they're not going to go pick them up. So right. they, they go out there, see how accurate they was. OK, all right, good job. And so they left out there and now the farmer's got cows on it and you know, the cows are tripping on them and all this <laughs> other stuff. And so he's like, please come dig these stupid yeah. things up. And so we're like, yeah. So yeah. we went and, and we, we did a whole day and we dug uh, probably 40 total, but there were only wow. about five that were in this shape. Because if you can see the one, I mean, it's going three feet into the ground and it's still filled with the sand that it was filled with from the 1930s and it's a hundred pounds. So, I mean, it was like, after you dig out the third one, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I don't have an excavator. I've just got a shovel, man. I am, I am done. I, I saw these photos and my immediate reaction was to my guilty pleasure movie, Joe Dirt. <laughs> where he's got the uh yes the bomb he attaches to his back and uh turns out it's uh 
it's a latrine uh thing but yeah um and then these so these look like some fossils so now we're getting to some of the yeah. fossils so uh the one to the top uh left is that's my buddy uh tyree lamp if you guys haven't ever heard of utah dump digger yeah uh, look all right utah dump digger that's that's ty that's my buddy uh we've been digging together for about 10 years now he is a world-class uh commercial paleontologist um he, he he puts on his boots every day all day and he goes dig dinosaurs he is one of the most knowledgeable human beings that I've ever met. This was this past summer. Um, uh, we hit, he found um, basically a bone bed layer. Uh, it was probably part of a, uh, either the curve of a river or a sandbar, more than likely a sandbar where a lot of bones collected, a lot of animals collected during the Cretaceous. So we're digging out some, um, we thought it was trike when we first started it, but it ended up all being hadrosaur, uh, just a pile of hadrosaur limbs basically. And so we're digging that out there. But yeah, if anybody, Utah Dump Digger, look them up on Facebook, follow them. They are super, super awesome people. And, and you know, ties, ties every day, all day, puts on his boots, goes, goes and dig dinosaurs and super knowledgeable. Um, so that's, that was this past summer on one of his ranches that he has a lease on. So what we'll do is, is, is every summer, and I've done this with my son since he was five. So, you know, I'm a, divorced dad. Uh, and I want to spend time with my kid. So when Isaac was five, I called up my buddies that dig shit up for a living. And I was like, Hey, I've got my son for a month. Can we come hang out and dig? <laughs> yeah, dude, come on. So and cool. every year this trip just got bigger and bigger. And now it's just this huge yeah, thing. I and mean, he's that's... 17 now. And so uh -huh. we hook up with all of our buddies and we go dig fossils. We sell the stuff uh, that we find or keep some of it. And then we buy stuff from the guys like Ty, you know, who's out there digging, we'll buy some stuff from them and then we'll sell that stuff in our shop and we'll film for chasing history. So it's a great opportunity to get some good, you know, educational documentary on how dinosaurs are found and guys like Ty, uh, Eamon Yeager's another buddy of mine were, um, uh, that's the one in the middle that's on, I think that's on one of Eamon's sites. I'm not, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Triassic stuff up in Arizona. Um, but uh, we'll hang out with these guys and, you know, they'll we'll do a documentary on how dinosaurs are found or how not rare fossils are. Like we did one with Ty where he took us to a. Um, so the way it is out west is it's really sketchy where it gets to BLM land and mm -hmm. private land. All right, let me see if I can explain this so everybody can understand. So what you have is is you've got a guy that's got a ranch. All right. 50,000 acres within that 50,000 acres are squares of public land. All right. These squares of public land, you can't hunt on, you can't collect on. We use GPS um, uh, and apps to prevent us from getting on sites that we don't, we're not supposed to collect on. We are really, really hardcore on that to make sure we're collecting on spots we're supposed to be collecting on. So anyway, there was this one square in the middle of this ranch that had a triceratops skull, you know, that was found 20 years ago. And so all of the appropriate people were notified, hey, there's literally an entire triceratops skull eroding and turning to dirt. You guys should go dig it. Five years. Hey, don't forget about this triceratops skull that's literally laying on the surface. You guys should go get it. Ten years go by. So anyway, 20 years later, there's nothing but bones left. There's or pieces, pieces like tiny, tiny, tiny pieces. If you go onto our YouTube channel, you can see that episode uh, yeah. and we show you what happens to fossils when you don't collect them. So, you know, that so with guys like Ty and, and Eamon and um, other guys we hang out with, we, we really do a lot of educational stuff to show people the reality of fossils, uh, the reality of the importance of collecting fossils. So it's like we go to a site. We'll pick up every fossil that's exposed, all of it. We'll come back the next year, and it's like we never touched it. There are there, It's producing that many fossils. But what's wild is, is the freeze-thaw mechanisms that are in place destroy fossils really, really, really quickly. Like, so if a fossil gets exposed, well, most people think that, okay, that fossil is just going to, it'll be there for 100 years, and you can pick it up whenever. No, it, it'll be there for six months. And then it'll be in a thousand little pieces. Mm. And the next six months, it'll be turned into dust. 
And so we've got, did a lot of episodes actually showing you guys fossils that are turning into powder and what it takes to save these fossils and get them out of the ground. One shot that we're working on is um, I want to put a time-lapse camera on yeah. a big bone coming, just starting to come on out of the ground cool. and just let it run and let it turn to dirt and to show people just how quickly that happens because right. it, it really, it'll blow your mind. So, uh, but anyway, so that, those pictures were out, uh, out with those guys digging some, you know, digging fossils, you know, hunting stuff and, and filming for our YouTube channel. So this is another, we're out digging. Uh, this is with, uh, Eamon Yeager digging Triassic fossils on, on his ranch in Northern Arizona. So there's not a lot of fossils out there from the Triassic. It's the first dinosaur period. So Eamon's another amazing human being. God, I, like Ty, I love these guys. They're some of my closest friends. And um, they're really passionate about the education as well. Eamon's uh, business is uh, Northwest Montana Fossils. He's from Northwest Montana, primarily focused on two medicine formation and then the Triassic fossils out of the Chin Lee formation. So uh, he's got a great Facebook and, and Instagram and all that Northwest Montana fossils. Look them up. They're really, really awesome. So the, we're on his site hunting for Triassic fossils and filming for our YouTube channel. And so that is, Hey, Isaac, <laughs> <laughs> buddy, Isaac popping in. Um, so that's with Eamon. What's fun about that is, is that, um, so we're, we're like two miles from a vehicle. There are no roads. So I should have sent that one picture. It was one time we were out home. We were so far back on this ranch that we had to like dog sled our finds back because they're like 100 pound plaster jackets. So like, how are we going to get these out? So we came up, we, we went to the store and bought freaking kids sleds and then we made like, like these little ties onto it. It looks like if you were to see some like guys in 1910, like crossing the Arctic, like uh, Shackleton yeah. Yeah, 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 crossing yeah. the Arctic with like these packs dragging the sled. That is exactly what we were doing. That's exactly how we had to get this stuff out of here. So sometimes it's just, man, it's, it's so hard to get some of this stuff out of here. But if we don't collect it, it'll turn to dirt. So that's digging Triassic stuff. It's um, th that's a whole fun thing, and it's it's in the Painted Desert, and it's some of the most beautiful country that you'll ever be in. Uh, the middle picture is uh, me and Isaac from this past summer. Uh, we're at again Amon's site. This is a two medicine formation site. This is this is he's the only one that I know that that hunts dinosaurs this way. This is in his quarry, and it's it's literally hard rock dinosaur hunting. So what Ooh, most people do like when they hunt for dinosaurs, they, uh, they're they looking for bones that are on the surface that are weathering out of a formation where the okay. ground's soft and it's not rock. Well, the two medicine is rock. Mm -hmm. And so what he found is, is you know, what you want to find is you want to find old river channels, old riverbeds, mm -hmm. because that's where stuff washes into. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, we see on National Geographic, uh, the wildebeest crossing the river and then you look and they always show a shot of like a hundred wildebeest dead piled up at the, you know, in a bend of a river. Well, those same natural processes that happen today happened back then. So in these bends of these rivers, there'll be piles of dinosaurs and then there'll be piles of the dinosaurs that were eaten on the dinosaurs. So, I mean, it's possible to find these spots where there's just, there's so many bones you can't, you can't even, you can't imagine wow. how many bones these are. And so when they find spots like that, they'll actually get heavy equipment, take the top soil, take, take the top layers off and open a quarry and actually okay. mine for the fossils. And the that's picture cool. in the middle, that's in Eamon's mine. He dug down about 50 feet to get to that layer and he oh, wow. exposes it uh, 20 feet at a time, 20 feet at a, as, at a season. That's and cool. we're there with rocks and chisels digging it out. If you go onto our YouTube channel, Chasing History, we've got several episodes actually on that site showing you how to how to hard rock dinosaur hunt. I mean, That's it's cool. it's flat out work, man. But man, the preservation of the fossils out of the two medicines yeah, in this yeah, site yeah, yeah, yeah. is just yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. 
I bet, so the, yeah. the last picture on the end is uh, Isaac and I from this past summer. Uh, this is Hunt and Amalite. So we're on mm -hmm. the banks of the, uh, I can't remember the river in Canada. So we're on the banks of the river there in Canada, uh, right outside the Corite mine with our uh, our buddy Johnny Isa. And we're collecting uh, Amalite fossils, how they were originally traditionally collected. So what's neat about the Amalite is, is that, is that, that material, when it reacts with oxygen, it starts to, de to degrade. And so the quality of the shimmer and the shine goes away. By mining it, they actually find higher quality fossils with better preservation. And so we're looking for amylite, but it's not like the really, really, really good stuff. Now, another thing, too, is that all fossils in Canada belong to the British crown. Yeah. So we had to get special permission from them to be allowed to collect. And then they had to look at everything that we found. And then they deemed whether we can have it or not. And we actually got a letter from the crown saying, yes, we bequeath these fossils, Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Byers. Uh, you may have these a gift from his royal majesty, <laughs> King Edward VII or whatever it was. <laughs> So, so that's where that was. That, that was really cool. And Johnny was just so awesome to let us, let us come out and do that. Cool. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do these things without an incredible group of friends. And I am so grateful for, for my, my brothers in history that just nerd out on finding this stuff and who love to share the passion, allow me to come dig with them, allow me to film for chasing history and uh you know hang out with you let my give me and my son an awesome adventure every every year so 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 i did look it up um this is according to wikipedia okay um amylite um a little bit of trivia for you here it was designated as the official gemstone of the city of lethbridge alberta in 2007 in 1981 it was given the official gemstone status Yep. So before yep. 81, it wasn't even a gemstone or nope. considered, but it is a calcium carbonate um, or aragonite. Yeah. Um, so it was poly aragonite. Yes. Yeah, so it is an aragonite polymorph um, and it can have minor amounts of calcite, pyrite, silica, um, other impurities. <clears throat> so, um, yes, it is an aragonite polymorph. I can't, um, I, and I think that number one billiard, if, you know, I'm trying to keep up with our followers. I think that's yeah, also you know. Mike. That's Mike, right? If you're Mike, if Mike Pales, if that's you, I'm pretty sure you have two accounts here. I think you were right. <laughs> yeah. So, so do be very careful um, if, because it is calcium carbonate. So similar to calcite, anything that acidic could damage it. Yeah. So what they do, what the Corite guys do is, is they'll polish it. And then they'll coat it in a protective coat to prevent any of that damage from from happening. So, um, so these pictures, so our fossils and minerals are, are is just a small part of my jam. Uh, another part of my jam is the artifact side. And so this was uh, at the Tucson show this past year. Um, I've got I've got pickers all over the world that pick stuff for me. And so this was one of my pickers that. Um, I was looking for a group of, of, you know, African spears that I could sell in my shop. And so he had found, you know, over the year, you know, year, he found a good group of, of spears for me. And so I bought a, a good bundle. The, the spear heads themselves are original. They're like, you know, 150, 200 years old, but the shafts wow. are, you know, within the past 50 years. So, wow. you know, that's, that's one of the reasons really why we cool. have them. Yeah. So that's one of the short period of time that they're <clears throat> using such primitive, tools oh yeah well they 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 don't have access to these you know during that time that's the colonial era mm -hmm. so, which is the era of pillage and plunder where european countries are going into primitive parts of the planet and are trying to see what mineral wealth mm -hmm. or natural mm -hmm. wealth that they can extract from it using local labor and so in order to get local labor they would need to trade the locals with something that was beneficial so what they would do is is in in europe and england they would manufacture iron spearheads and okay. then they would bring just the heads and trade the heads for whatever good that they want and then those local cultures would put a shaft on them and use them for their daily travel use the same thing happened in this country you know where um 
uh, European countries were during the fur trade era were bringing European goods like pots and kettles and beads and knives oh, yeah. and were trading to the Native sure. Americans, yeah. you know, beads and pots and knives for furs for the fur trade over in Europe. Gotcha. So same thing, it, colonial history. You want to talk about a terrible experience yeah. in human history. The colonial era was it. So anyway, so you can still find a lot of these old, old spears. So in, in the shop, we've got artifacts literally from all over the world. Um, not just spanning every culture, but just really every part of the world we, we've got something from. And so we've got a, a tribal art case. And so we picked up those spears from one of my pickers for, for that. Uh, the next picture is, uh, I'm a big documents nerd. Like I'm like hardcore, like I love nerding out on, on documents. <laughs> so we're in a, uh, we got into a museum in uh, Tombstone, Arizona that was closed and uh, they were selling the, the part of the museum that wasn't that didn't have to do with tombstone history. And in that was an incredible library of antique documents from the West and other places. And so we got to go through and purchase, you know, a bunch of stuff from that museum. So we, we do a lot of museum deacquisition stuff. So we're on a, on a call list with a number of museums. And the requirement is, is that, you know, we don't say which museum, but museums all the time get stuff donated to it. But the problem is, is they get so much stuff donated to it. They right. don't have the room to store it. Right. And so what they'll do is they'll contact guys like me. And I'll purchase stuff from them. And that gives the museum the funds that they need in order to, you know, continue operations. But, you know, museums are great storehouses for important artifacts. But for most people's collection, it's not going to it's, it's, it's not important stuff. It's better doing its job being out among the people, inspiring the people about yeah. that period of history. So. Uh, so anyway, so that was that was uh, one of the museum, one of the museum museums that we hit up so <laughs> these, these look like some dirty some dirty pictures here. oh man dude, uh, dude you, you gotta get dirty doing this you still I mean, gotta get dirty <laughs> there's no you can't stay clean man just, you just, and, and that's what i love so so the first two uh that's my son isaac when he was a couple i think he's like 13 in there. Um, <laughs> that's with a buddy of mine, Eddie Roddick. And Eddie is uh, an Iranian American living in Tucson. Uh, he's got a landscaping business and he's a metal detectorist. And so he takes in a dump digger. So he takes us out uh, in Southern Arizona to go dig. Uh, he's got permission on several ranches that have ghost towns on them. And so oh, we'll cool. dig through the ghost town dump looking for Ooh, old bottles or history cool. or stuff, as well as hunting for military artifacts. Uh, there was the most people have never heard of the of the Pershing campaign or the Pershing expedition. But the United States in 1916 actually invaded Mexico during their civil war. Mexico was in the middle of a civil war. Pancho Villa had crossed the border into Brownsville, Texas and shot the place up. So the, and at that same time, uh, this actually why we entered World War One. Not a lot of people know this. So what the U.S. got, they intercepted a letter. The British intelligence intercepted it and then sent it to the Americans in 1916, a letter from the German consulate to the Mexican consulate telling the Mexican consulate that, hey, we want to keep the United States out of World War One. So here's out of this great war. So here's what I want you to do. We will give you guns and ammunition and funding if you will attack America. And if you win and we'll help you. And if you win, we'll make sure you get back California and Arizona and New Mexico and everything that you lost in 1848. We'll make sure you get back. So that was like, whoa, wait, what? So that's it wasn't Lusitania. This is one of the things that pushed America into World War One. So what we did was is we sent the National Guard 100,000 troops from Texas to California to set up these um, these forts along the Mexican border to ensure that, you know, Mexico doesn't invade the United States. And they did a campaign where it was the, it was the very last campaign of the United States Cavalry, where they were guys on horseback going into an area on a military expedition. And so uh, they were there hunting Pancho Villa. So we're hunting those sites. Uh, it's really cool. It's a really important history for the uh, Buffalo soldiers, for the, the mm. 10th and 24th uh, infantry. 
and um, in that history because that's where the, the greatest combat, the most experienced combat soldiers that the United States had at the time were the African-American Buffalo soldiers. And so they were really heavily involved in these campaigns. And so we're hunting a lot of air sites. And so there's not a lot of places that you can go where you have that history. And so we collect artifacts from that history, uh, metal detected. And then we make these really cool flame, frames that talk about that history. And what we're mostly doing is we're hunting old campsites, we're hunting dumps where they would throw stuff away. You know, a lot of this stuff is found just in dumps. I mean, and, and and just like we have dumps today, they had dumps back then, only their dump was over there. You know, they just right. threw it in a gully or threw it in a creek or threw it in a, in a pile and set it on fire. And that's what we're looking for. You know, they didn't have organized trash pickup or trash collection like we do today. And the reason is, is because they didn't have the amount of disposable trash that we have today. So they didn't have a whole lot. So there wasn't a whole lot of it out there. So that's what we're, that's what we're hunting. We're all. <laughs> damn yeah. nasty looking I love that, the text. <laughs> that, that, that reminds me, I, I should send you, um, when I'm out picking agates in one of the fields that I have access to, I actually completely <laughs> scared the heck out of me. I was out looking for agates one time and usually I'm by myself and it's a large field and the farmer's not out because it's too early and whatever. And I'm just kind of like singing to myself, doing my thing. And all of a sudden someone came out of nowhere and I was like, what the hell? And he was talking to me. He was from our Minnesota Historical Society and said that he had looked up some old like maps and things in the area. And he was asking me if I knew where this trail was because the, apparently there was a trail that was near this field that went towards there a bar that was kind of at like the edge of the field and i usually when i go you know out i'll find certain things uh, anything that's like trash i'll pick up um but i'll find like glass pieces and i have i should send you pictures but i have they're like the tops of like bottles oh cool that there i don't know if it's from if it was a bar or whatever there and i and i have actually they're like a purplish kind of color glass yeah, that's the manganese. So yeah, glass it, it fluoresces from, really great. Yeah, it does. So ma glass in the turn of the century, they use manganese, I think, as a hardener for it. But when manganese is exposed to UV light for a long time, uh, that exposure will cause it to turn purple. So mm. that's how you can, that's okay. one of the ways that you can date bottles is okay. if it has that purple tinge that's to it. Cool. You can artificially do that where you can take bottles that have never been exposed to UV. You can have a UV light box. I've got one downstairs where you can throw bottles in it and it'll kind of turn it this purple. Or some guys just take them and throw them on their roof and let the sun do it oh. in a year. Right. It'll turn purple. Okay. So anytime you're in an antique store and you see a purple bottle, it was exposed to the sun. Okay. Wow. Nine times out of 10. So. Okay. Cool. But yeah, send me pictures, dude. I mean, see, and that's just it. History is literally everywhere. Wherever, who, whoever's watching this, literally wherever you are in your hometown, wherever that is, there is history to find, whether it be human history, fossil history, geologic history. There's cool stuff there to find. You've just got to get out and go find it. And your search can start at Wikipedia. What the can I find in my county? You know? <laughs> so you can you can go. There's history everywhere. When I built my cabin, you know, there was I was kicking up pottery from the Civil War. You know, the flow blue uh, where and I was like, what? The? And that led me to find there was a cabin here back before the Civil War. So even in a place that I thought nobody lived on ever, there were people that lived here. So wherever wherever you are, there's history to find because it, it's it's literally everywhere. Yeah, I, I got really lucky, and the people that, um, I just bought a house this past summer, and the people that owned it before me kept records of everything, and oh, wow. not just, like, you know, 2010, there was a hailstorm, and we replaced the roof, but, like, they kept records all the way back to when, like, it, the house was built in the 1960s and they actually have records of before the house was built and it that's was a cool. chicken farm and like all of this stuff and it's like oh man that's so just, cool yeah and it was like finding that when i was like looking through the house i was like wow like you almost never get that kind of history of like what was there like all the way back to no. you know before it was built so yeah there's so much it. cool stuff do you still live there yeah, yeah, I just, I mean, I just Dude, bought the metal, house, metal you know, the summer. 
metal detected. You can find old coins. I mean, even in old houses, man, just think of how much stuff you or your kids have lost in your yard. Okay. In your lifetime. All right. Now look at a house that's a hundred and something years old and imagine how many stupid kids have lost stupid things in that stupid yard for the past however long. <laughs> so do their stuff to go find, like go metal detect. Uh, I love metal detecting around old houses and finding cool stuff because there's always there's always something to find because human beings lost stuff. That's why privies, the, the last picture that you have. Uh, that we were, that was on the, that last series. That was us. We were digging. Uh, that's the nastiest I've ever been in my entire life. So we were digging in, uh, we had dug a privy and we were digging a cistern. So the technology going back to the Romans and, and before that, that human beings implemented in order to have drinking water, bathing water, cooking water, was they would have a setup called a cistern where they would collect the rainwater from the roof into an underground storage container. Well, in the early 1900s, indoor plumbing came along and cisterns were now outdated technology. They didn't need it. So they've got trash. They've got a giant hole they don't need anymore. They need to fill up. So for a couple of years, all the trash they'd throw down into the cistern. And that was the case with this cistern. It was, tw it was almost 20 feet deep it was eight feet wide. It was, God, it was huge. But they had thrown batteries down in there, like 400 bottles, old <laughs> sign. Here, hold on. I'll show you. Oh, you see, I'll show you. That sign in my kitchen right there came out of that hole, that, <laughs> that velvet tobacco oh. sign. So that came out of that hole. So they would throw all Which, kinds of Which, by the way, I just want to say, everyone, we're, we're looking at, this is Chase's home. If anyone ever wondered, what does Chase's home look like? Uh, yeah. Can we go back to the big screen here? So we can, <laughs> yeah, how not, cool that Chase's home is just so, like, yeah, like, you're, not, like you're living well, in time. I, mean, <laughs> I, I like artifacts. So yes, it, my, cool. my gardening <laughs> thing is going on right now. That's my gardening system. And then you know, artifacts in the fireplace. And I, I love like, it. Go back, go back, go back. Like, look at that. Like, what the heck? Like, I so, like, so what? me and this, and, and this, so I dug all the rock off the farm to build the fireplace. And me and this old African-American World War II and Korean War vet built it. That so, is so cool. it was a really cool experience that we got to have. But, you know, I, I collect too. Like, I, you know, I'm, this is my passion. The stuff that I collect are things that, you know, need a little bit extra care. They're things that really should end up in a museum, you know, because like I said at the beginning, you know, this stuff is going to outlive us. And, you know, our job is to take care of it so it can do it. It can do its thing and tell its story. And there are pieces that I come across that should go in a museum. It's like I just picked up a, a piece off of the USS Arizona that it's as far as I know, it's the only part of the USS Arizona that's been blessed by the U.S. Navy and officially designated as, yes, this is a piece of the USS Arizona in private hands. Wow. So that's something that I'm going to wait until I find a museum and get it into a museum where it needs to belong. And that's the right. true with a lot of the artifacts around my house. That's the stuff I keep and I hold on to are the things that really should go into a museum, you know, plus the stuff Isaac and I find and, and, you know, a lot of that stuff's in there. So, but yeah, I, <laughs> I really do like this stuff. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first picture there, that's uh, me and Eddie and my buddy, Andreas Kerner, uh, my, my German American buddy. Uh, we're out metal detecting a dump. We're standing on an old highway that's now defunct um, and metal detecting an old ghost town site. Uh, so out in the desert, it's like 120 degrees and we're just so happy to be out sweating to death looking for stuff this is in july like nobody's going into the desert but us because we're crazy so <laughs> we're metal detecting the one in the middle is is we're looking for uh privy so um that's my buddy um mike babera in the middle uh he's a professional uh bottle digger that's all he does is dig bottles mm. Um, and so he, we're looking for the privy and the rod that he has in his hand is called a probe rod. It's basically a spring steel rod. So when dirt has been d disturbed, it's, it never compacts the same. So you take a rod and you stick it into dirt that's never had a hole dug into it. And it's really tough and it's got a really consistency. Well, then you go over to a spot 
that a hole has been dug there. Even though it's been dug 100 years ago and filled in, it's the ground has been disturbed. And so the rod goes in much easier. And it's a method. It's a tech, a very primitive technique, technique, but a technique to to hunt bottles. And so that was on the great the great cistern dig where where I pulled out my my sign. And then the the last one over there, that's my uh, that's me and my son, Isaac. We uh, so we're volunteer historical interpreters at uh, Wilderness Road State Park and other state parks that that want to have us around. If you guys have, are in the southwest Virginia area and you want to go to a like killer, like where does the history nerd go to do his history thing? I this is it. So uh, Wilderness Road State Park or Martin Station is a 1775 era British fort. It is a uh, frontier fort that was literally built on the edge of the frontier. This was the most isolated fort in colonial America at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. And so uh, a buddy of mine named Billy Heck back in the early 2000s rebuilt the actual fort site by hand using 18th century tools, 18th century techniques, eating 18th century food, and wearing 18th century clothing. And it was the first time that that had been done in history since the 18th century. So uh, they call it experimental archaeology, where that's he's cool. actually, it's so cool. Uh, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that, like, that's cool. It's it's badass is what it is. I mean, so there's a story where he, uh, they were hewing some logs and he, he was a, a medic in the uh, first Gulf War. And so he was hewing some logs and just sliced right into his foot. And so he did it 18th century style where he went over to a horse, pulled a horse hair, got his needle and sewed oh his foot God. up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, That's it's hardcore. Crazy. Oh so my God. We, Isaac and I so reenact, you reenact that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We reenact oh, the so 18th century. Cool. So what we do is, is, is we go there, we learn uh, crafts and techniques that, that, you know, people, the way people lived in the 18th century, the things that they would make, we learn to make, um, and then we would uh, teach those to visitors that come come by. So the, the joke for me is that I died in 1780 and woke <laughs> up here and was like, what the hell is a cell phone? Why? Why am I here? And right. so whenever I want to escape and like get away from technology and everything and everybody, I go play. You know, I go back to 1780. It's where like I it's died. LARPing. I, I mean, like it's, it's I mean, in my mind, I think LARPing and I and I'm like. You know, you know, people can say what they want, nerdy, whatever. Like that is so much fun and cool. Oh, like I so totally much need to get into that world. Like that is a great escape where you can just get away from this world and go into the previous world and just. Well, and we get to teach too. That's yeah. what's really cool is, is, you know, imagine walking on a lot of people, they walk onto a historic site and you're like, oh, this historic site. Well, that's cool. But when you walk onto a historic site with historical interpreters on it who are wearing the clothing and doing the things, it uh, makes it a whole different experience. Oh, and that's yes. why we, we love to do it. I've done it with Isaac since he was, since he was one year old. Oh I've done it gosh, with him. So he was so running cool. around. I peeing all that. over everything with just like a <laughs> shirt rolled up. Uh, he's done it forever. So, so that's, that's our big, our big thing. We, cool. we go reenact. Um, so these pictures, these are on um, my buddy, Andreas, who you saw in the previous uh, pictures. Um, uh, he, uh, this was in uh, his home area, the Palatinate region of Southwest Germany. We went there to film some chasing history episodes and these are actual Roman sites that uh, these are sites that were built by the Romans that are still standing. So it's hard to fathom. Uh, this is in the city of Trier. And in the city of Trier is the largest concentration of Roman monuments and buildings north of the Alps. So this was it. It was actually Trier was the capital of the Roman Empire during Constantine the Great's era. Constantine the Great started his political career in the city of Trier. And so when he became emperor, he kind of moved the, the political heart from Rome to Trier, which is in which was Germania, which you know, gladiator, you know, Germania. So anyway, so we're we're in Roman Germany in Trier. The building behind us is the um, it's the Emperor's Palace, the Basilica of Constantine. It's a church now. It still has church services, uh, but it's it's a Roman building made of Roman bricks that has stayed standing and has been occupied continuously since the Roman era, which is just 
it's mind blowing to people to think that you can walk into a building that the Romans in togas walked into and did yeah. their Roman thing. That's, and, and then you can still walk into it today. So like, like we, a normal person, like that's yeah. crazy. So we but, did an yeah. episode episode on that and on Trier. That's actually up on our YouTube channel. Now, if people want to see that one, go to chasing history and you'll see the Roman Trier episodes. The next picture is a picture of um, that is the bridge over the river Mosul. That's another Roman bridge. So the pyres, the, the, the limestone uh, pyres that you see, those were uh, originally laid down by the Romans, have not been touched since the Romans laid them down. Wow. All right. The only thing that has been done to that bridge is, is it was restored twice. And it's the top portion of the bridge yeah. in the, I think the 1200s, it was rebuilt. And then again, in the early 18th century, it was rebuilt. And now it's got cars driving over it. And so it's an example of Roman engineering that is still functioning and still going strong to this day. So it's just a super cool, cool thing. We, we got to reenact a cool ritual, you know, Romans, you know, pagan and do all this crazy stuff. So one thing that they would do is they would throw coins off the center of the bridge uh, as like a thing to the gods. So we went up and we threw a coin off the bridge. Yeah. Well, then we were doing some later research back in the seventies, there was a severe drought. And so archeologists went out to the middle of there and they found like four thousand roman coins and artifacts wow. and oh stuff. yeah oh man it oh was man yeah awesome. i can imagine awesome. all those finds yeah they found a lot of cool stuff so so that was part of our our trip to germany and like i said if anybody wants to see those go to our youtube channel chasing history we've got those up they're really cool episodes they yeah, we they do really the roman are. bass we we see the oldest bottle of wine uh, Andreas got us permission to film literally the oldest bottle of wine in existence. It's oh, yeah, 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 it's yeah, yeah. I remember still that. intact. Yeah. It's still wow. intact. It has not been opened. It came and from I, a Roman burial mm -hmm. and it I looks terrible. It looks like kombucha. I mentioned yeah. that. It, it looks it's funky looking. It's, it's not, you well, you, you've it. got some some mammoth meat to pair it with the wine. So <laughs> have to see right. what that tastes. A little like. mammoth meat and cheese, maybe some grapes, a <laughs> little Roman wine. So, but yeah. So, so we 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 do a you know, or I I do a lot. I I don't just do one thing. You know, my my obsession knows no bounds, and like I said, nobody's stopping me. And even if they tried, they wouldn't be able to stop me. So, you know, whatever I find fascinating or interesting, you know, I go out, I film for educational purposes. I, you know, do my YouTube stuff, my education stuff. I'll pick up stuff for my shop uh, and I'll go and dig stuff and I'll meet the people that, you know, do it every, all day, every day and just surround myself with history. No matter what it is in history, I find it all interesting and I surround myself with it. So you, yeah, I, I, I do a lot. <laughs> I'll so be I, pretty busy. <laughs> so I know that we're, we're, we're getting short in our time here, but I do so that you, you did mention and you said the statement, you know, someone tried to stop me. I'm still going to still do what I'm going to do. It, it, it talking about a little bit on what we talked about with Keely or no, no, not Keely. Um, our previous guest that we had um, and Amos? talking about, and no, before Amos, I've had a couple of drinks of wine. I'm just sorry. Oh. <laughs> so I, I'm not having the best memory right now. But okay. what was the, before Amos? Um, oh, oh, the <clears throat> Science Foundation. Oh, Tom Hebert. Yeah, Tom. So we were talking a little bit. We got really intimate about academia and, um, yeah. yeah. And, and commercial and, and collecting. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, just to talk a bit about 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 that, because, you yeah, know, there, I'd love to. There's, a, there's a disconnect in that world. And, yeah. you know, we've heard a perspective from Tom and it, it just, you know, let's, let's talk about it. Well, the thing is, is that both groups, both parties, um, you know, and, and I work with academia and a lot of my friends that I know, we work with academia and work really well with academia. Um, the problem is, is you get certain individuals, both in the collector world and in the academic world that hate each other. And that doesn't, we're all in it for the same thing. We, we want history. We want to understand. We want to know. We want to benefit science. And so it is 
so important that both of these worlds come together and work together because we're all interested in the same thing. So, you know, I, in the collector world, it's more, more so in the fossil world than the archeology span world. So as, as someone who's seen both sides, you know, I, I get, I totally, man, I totally get where academia is coming from and I don't blame them because there are people out there that are just in it for the money that are out it to find what they can find because they're curious or they can make money or whatever. They don't care about the science. They care about the thing. And so their argument is a very valid argument. But I also get the collector world where, you know, the academia doesn't pay any attention to these amazing finds that collectors are work are finding. I mean, look at fossils. The greatest 10 fossils that were discovered in the past 50 years were dis most of them were discovered by amateurs. Um, you know, the dueling dinosaurs, a buddy of mine found that, you know, and it's now, and it's a hugely important find to science. So, you know, it's really important that both of them find a middle ground to work yeah. with, you know, Amateur collectors need to be doing it right. I think that, you know, you, if you're going to do this, you've got to do this right. I love the but laws how do you that do, England, How do you do it right? When you say that, you when you say do it right. You, you, you record your finds. You, so England's got a great series of laws uh, for okay. artifact collecting. And I think it's the same is true for fossil collecting. Uh, I know in Florida has some really great laws for fossil collecting. So, but we'll start with artifacts. So okay. you're allowed to go metal detect. You're allowed to go hunt sites, private land. As long as it's private land and not a protected site, you are allowed to go hunt it. But what with you permission. have to do with permission, of course, that's yes. the, that goes without that's saying. That's the basic, yes. Yeah. So you, you get to go and you get to collect artifacts, but then what you have to do is, is you have to take that to your local agent who works for the government, who looks at everything that you find and says, okay, this is all common stuff. We really don't need it, but this coin is a super rare coin and we want it in our museum. And so we'd like to have that coin. So then what happens is a third party independent appraiser comes in, they appraise that coin and they pay the collector, the finder, a fair market value for that piece. And so it's a win-win for everybody. And I think a system like that here in this country would be hugely, hugely important and beneficial. Um, <clears throat> so in the fossil world, uh, same thing. If, if things that are important to science, like, like state of Florida, for example, you have to show all the fossils that you find to the state and the state looks at it. I don't know if they, I don't think they pay you for it, but what they get to do is they get to pick what they want. That's important to science. They get to pick it. And a lot of, in, in the fossil world, people want, man, they want their stuff to go to science because in, in the fossil world, they are passionate about the science more so in the fossil world than in the artifact world, you know, yeah. but it's just, it's both sides needing to work together. There really needs some be some laws in place that protect yeah. historic sites, but allow people to collect things because here's one thing that is happening. Artifacts are being destroyed every day mm -hmm. yeah. right, by our own progress and development. So people that go out and collect artifacts, they think they're doing a good thing by saving this history, especially you know, let's look at Civil War artifacts. So they're fixing to build this interstate through a Civil War site. So let guys go in and metal detect and find everything that they can that gets those artifacts out of the ground so that they don't get pushed over and bulldozed. Because the construction methods in the 21st century aren't the same as they were 50 or 100 years ago. So one thing that's really cool, England's another great example. You can go to a site that was a Roman site, all right? In the medieval era, they came in, they built a medieval thing. But the Roman site's still intact because they're working with the land. The Victorians come in and they add on to it. But they're still working with the land. So the medieval, right. so the Roman stuff's still intact. The medieval stuff's still intact. And the Victorian stuff's still intact. Are intact. But the way we construct in the 21st century, and we're just destroyed. Site and we bulldoze it flat. And yeah. so all of that history is gone and erased. The dirt gets hauled off somewhere else. And so that history, that literally the history of that spot is wiped off the face of the earth. So it's it, that's why it's important for private individuals to be allowed to go out and collect because they're trying to save this history. Right. They need to be a lot better at recording their finds. That's something. Proper education. It, archaeological groups in this country used to work great with amateurs back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, right. where they would teach you, you would go and take a course on 
you know, how to properly collect artifacts, how to record the data. They would allow you to go on a private land to collect, record the data. The, uh, the universities got the data. You got the artifacts. It was a, it was a really good win-win. They stopped doing that. And if you ask a lot of universities of that practice, they'll, they have amnesia, you know, yeah. but those guys are still alive. You can, right. you can still talk to them to the day that participated in this. So, there needs to be laws passed that, you know, protect important sites more so than what we have now um, that allows collectors and academia to work together to, you know, benefit and better, you know, our understanding of the past because we we all want that. So I, one thing I'd really love to do with my life is because I have experienced both worlds and I work in both worlds is I would love to try to help make that happen, you know, just create yeah. some federal laws where, you know, we can preserve and protect our history to make sure that the stuff gets out of the ground that needs to get out of the ground. You know, it's like for fossils, for example, you cannot collect on public lands. Absolutely not. So it's like that triceratops skull that we filmed. It's still sitting out there. It's in a billion pieces. It's still sitting out there. But if there was a permitting system where you could go and get a dinosaur hunting permit, just like you get a hunting license to go hunt deer on right. public land, right. you get a permit where you can go hunt fossils on public land. You can collect that stuff, take it to your local agent, show them if it's important to science, they get it. And if it's not, you get to keep it because those fossils are going to be destroyed, period. Right. Like that's not an exaggeration. It's happening right now. Freeze thaw. You can't, for those that don't know the freeze thaw mechanism, rocks are porous and rocks have water in them. And so what happens is when temperatures drop, the water molecules within those rocks freezes and expands and slowly starts to create cracks within those rocks. More water seeps in and freezes. The cracks get bigger. The process continues until that rock is turned into dirt. That's what nature does. That's what this planet is all about is taking rocks and making it into dirt. And they're doing that with fossils. So- yeah. You know, I, I would love to see both worlds come together, but as it stands right now, both worlds hate each other. They're not talking. Mm -hmm. They have no desire to work together. And, and yeah. that's a shame. And yeah. that's a shame for yeah, the history, really especially in this day and age where our construction methods destroy it. Yeah. So, and, you know, there's been a lot of uh, terrible practices that, that have been done by amateurs as well. So, you know, I won't well, if you those, are, but. if you are, do you know who am I on? Oh, yeah, I am. Sorry. Do you know who Tom Hebert is? Oh, man, that name's real familiar. I'm terrible okay. with names. Okay, I'm so like, bad you guys, with names. You guys taught me too. <laughs> you two totally align. Like he's, he is totally on your wavelength with things. He's in the, in, in paleontology. Um, it, it would be exciting to see people that have this passion that to see change, like come together and make it happen. I yeah. mean, because you know, when I hear these, when I hear this and it's like, yeah, I, I, let's do it. <laughs> How do you make it happen? <laughs> it, what the biggest stopgap right now is getting, and I'm not trying to point the finger. It's just within my own experience. This is the way the biggest prevention and stopgap is the academic world. They do not want people, not all of them, but a fair number don't, they don't want to create that. They want to be the only ones that are allowed to collect the stuff in the state of Florida right now. They're trying to make it illegal to collect fossils yeah. Yeah, in the state that. of Florida. No, that's, that's crazy. That's, well, I mean, the state of Florida, crazy. I mean, let's but just get it real. They've got a lot of crazy things going on. <laughs> but, but here's the thing is, is that you have people within academia that know that that's a bad idea. Because their understanding of Florida's fossil past, because the better finds come from all these people from that are out there finding it. And doing out there the right every thing. day doing so, it. Yeah. But within that world, you have people that are totally against it. So it really, it, it's going to take both groups coming together. Yeah. And I really hope that that happens. I'd love to help make that happen. I don't know how to do that, but I really hope that, that it happens one day because, you know, we... There, there's, you know, that historical thing, whatever it is, whether it's a fossil or a artifact, there's only one of it. And yeah. so, you know, it needs it needs to needs to have a good home. It needs to be allowed to tell its story and not yeah. lay out in the sun, baking and falling apart or scooped up by a bulldozer and hauled off to somewhere to make fill dirt for some place where it's lost forever. Right. So. Yeah. And, and I just want to add to that, too, um, in case anyone's like, oh, Chase is biased because he like would benefit from it or whatever. 
Um, I've got, I've got like two instances. So like one, um, there is um, a, a ranch that we go and find dinosaur bones out of Montana that we do trips to every year. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the property owner has mentioned that she goes for walks and she'll go on to BLM land and she has found dinosaur, but like a skull on BLM land, Swicy told way. the office, done all of that, and they don't come out. No, and they what, don't. And what, what she does is she just like kind of buries it every year so that it's still there. But mm -hmm. she's like, you know, hey, here's where it is, whatever. And they just don't come out. Um, well, it goes so, back. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and I was just going to say, and similar to that, too, um, I, I listened to a talk from a British paleontologist who came to Montana to, to look for dinosaur bones. And they got contacted by a rancher that was like, hey, I've got this bone. It's in this like wash. Um, can you guys come out and look for it and see what it is and whatever? And they came out, excavated the whole thing, got it out. And they worked. With, they had someone from Montana, from the BLM office there with them getting it out. And they took it to the BLM office. But like they said, this would have been gone in one season. It would have taken yeah. one rain event to take that fossil, wash it out of the because it was just precariously like on the hillside and it would take him one big flood to just get it out of the hillside wash it down the stream tumble it to where it breaks up into pieces and it would have been gone so this i know like people might think like oh chase is might be trying to take advantage or whatever and it's like no like yeah. this is the real thing that fossils yeah. are just disintegrating out there that if people aren't you know collecting them they're just they're gonna be gone disappearing well, the, the, the state paleontologist for the state of Utah said publicly that the state of Utah will never dig another sauropod. Okay. So because it goes back to what we were saying earlier, fossils aren't rare. You know, they're not. And institutions have millions of fossils. So they're not teaching paleontologists right now. Same thing with archaeologists. Um, uh, Chris Kaufman, who manages the store for me, he went to school for archaeology. He's a he's a papered archaeologist in his class. They weren't teaching you to dig stuff out in the field. They were teaching you to research what was in the collections. Cool. The same thing is true for paleontology. They're, they're shifting that focus because they have so much stuff, not to go out and dig stuff in the field, but to research the stuff that's already been dug up. They don't have the room. And what it all boils down to is, is that the public doesn't care. That's the, that's the point. All of it is the public doesn't care. And how we know the public doesn't care is because there's not the funding available to these, you know, to the BLM to go collect fossils. The funding's just not there. And they don't have the staff to go collect every fossil that somebody on a hiking trail says that's out there. So until the funding is there and until people care, you know, these these systems aren't going to be in place to get these collected under the current system. So that's why you need to work with amateurs as free labor to go out and to collect this stuff and to make sure that when those important things are found or someone stumbles across them, they get to the right place, you know, because they don't need every triceratops limb or triceratops tooth that's ever been found you know dinosaurs yeah. shed their teeth throughout their lifetime right. dinosaurs Bye. shed their teeth like sharks throughout their lifetime the second most abundant fossil we find in the record are dinosaur teeth all right they don't need every single tooth you know one animal ten thousand teeth you know and they they live for millions of years so you know but there's gonna be something that you know it's gonna make a big difference and so yeah, we, we, we talked, I, I think we talked, I don't know if it was the last episode about, um, I think it was in Europe, an amateur paleontologist who was walking their dog. Oh yeah. And yeah. Found a like 70% complete titanosaur, like fossil skeleton. Um, and so it, it's, it kind of goes, you know, with, you know, yes, like if you find something report it, whatever, but <clears throat> just because it's, it's sort of like, I'm sure you've dealt with this with artifacts and antiques. You know, some people think just because it's old, it must be worth something. And um, it's not. Yes. So just because, you know, it's a fossil, it doesn't necessarily mean it's worth, you know, a bunch of money or it's worth a bunch scientifically either. Um, so it, I think there, there needs to be possibly even just more education to the public about, Hey, like, yes, it is important if you find a vertebrate fossil on public land to not collect it and report it, 
Yep. But that's the law, and that's what you have to do. You need to obey the current laws. No matter yeah. what you think or feel, the yes. current laws is you are not allowed to collect vertebrate. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm promoting the collecting of anything on public lands. I am not. I'm telling you, follow the law, do it the letter of the law, mark it with GPS it, and go tell you know your local um, uh, federal um, management resource person. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and but yes, we just you know, need to come together though, like as like people that live here in this country and say like, okay, like what are we doing? How can we make things better? And how can we work together? Especially with history and documenting. And I mean, just to see these things go to waste is like sad. Like how many schools could have kids learning from these fossils that are just sitting there deteriorating, you know, not only, like, Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying like that, just that alone is, is monumental. Not only can right now, can every school in the country have a dinosaur fossil, but every kid in the United States can have a dinosaur fossil. That's how many that are out there. You can, it can be done tomorrow. You know, you can get a dinosaur fossil for every kid in the country. And what do you think that's going to do? The, people don't get in. People do get some inspiration from movies and books. But when you put something in somebody's hand, that's the game changer. And that's where that's where these things can be a best of service is to be in people's hands. And that's what we try to do. We try to get things into people's hands. You know, it's not rare. We're not robbing science of anything. You know, we're ensuring that if we and when we're out there, if we come across something important, that we make sure it gets to the right place. Um, because discoveries happen all the time. One thing that, you know, when I was interviewing the the curator of the or the creator of paleontology from the Terrell Museum this past summer, you know, he said, um, he admitted that because of this mining operation, because yeah. Corite is doing this mining operation, we are learning more about the Cretaceous marine habitat uh, in this part of Alberta than we would have ever have learned just collecting ourselves out in the field. This mining operation allowed us to learn more about that period. So it commercial stuff is good because when it's set up to go to the right places, science benefits. And the same thing is true for the, in the state of Florida. We know more about the Pleistocene period in Florida because of amateurs collecting stuff. But really where you get into some of the problem is, is and this is true on both sides, is the egos on both sides. You know, everybody wants to be the person that finds it, yes. you know. So, you know, I, I think we need to put ego away and, you know, really care about, about you know, trying to get more people interested in history and trying to learn more about whatever era it is that we're trying to learn about. So well, there's definitely the stuff out there to do it. Yeah, and I mean, you, you just look at, like, you know, the Mammoth dig site in South Dakota and, and Hot Springs or the Gray or the gray you know, side, dig site. you know, yeah. if, if they were doing construction and the construction guys didn't say anything and they literally paved over it, <clears throat> we would never have found all of these huge discoveries yep. that are there and were, you know, brought to the public eye because of, you know, someone that saw it, followed the law and said, you know, hey, there's something here and someone should look at it. And, you know, it, it, the the system worked i guess in that case so yeah. but know, there's a lot of times where that system breaks down especially when it comes to construction because the last thing a foreman on a construction site wants to do wants to hear is hey we found a bunch of arrowheads that is yeah. not what they want to hear it's but, i i do i do environmental consulting and we do a lot of construction <clears throat> projects and to tell someone that you found anything and they have to slow down or yeah. do something that's going to cost more money or whatever yes like i but see, that's a very that. fixable thing because that's a mindset. That's an attitude thing. But if we have a couple generations set up to where they have a love and appreciation for our past and our history. So when that little kid is now an adult construction foreman and he finds something, he's going to be or she is going to be excited and they're going to want to see that the proper science is done and they're not going to have a problem with stopping construction. It's, it's a mindset of our appreciation for the past is what is what we're suffering from right now as a country and as a culture. You know, America, for all its you know amazing 
traits and what we are, we have we do not have an appreciation for for history, unfortunately. I, so. I do want to take a quick tangent. <laughs> Sue's asked this question, and I'm actually going to expand on this into three parts. So she asked where your favorite place is to dig. And I want to ask to dig fossils, artifacts, and rocks or minerals. Oh, man, that's a hard one. <laughs> fossils, man, it's so hard to narrow down. But I, I got to say, um, uh, my buddy, Eamon Yeager with Northwest Montana Fossils, uh, he his quarry is right on the edge of the Rockies. It's where the plains meet the Rockies. And so you're sitting there digging dinosaurs and you get up and you turn around and there's the Rocky Mountains. And it is just so gorgeous. Now, it's also in the county with the highest concentration of grizzly bears anywhere in the lower 48 states. So we're actually when we when we hunt dinosaurs there, we hunt armed because we've been run out of the quarry by grizzly bears before. And we come down in the quarry and see grizzly bear poop next to our tools. Okay. So, you know, uh, that that's probably my favorite place for fossil. And, and the Great Plains, too. Uh, buddy of mine, Ty, has got a site in uh, in South Dakota that you're just you're standing on this high hill overlooking the great North American prairie, this vast grassland, one of the great grasslands. We call it flyover country because we don't have an appreciation for it. But it's one of the great grassland ecosystems on the planet. And you're standing there and you're looking and you're not seeing any trees or nothing. And just imagine it's just, oh, man, it's it's awesome. So I just have to laugh at that because as somebody who lives in a very flat area, like, uh, like I have no appreciation for flatland. I'm sorry. You, you, you should, if you have the chance to get to Northwest Montana, I, I've done a lot of work in Great Falls in the last year. And we did trip up to the Montana, uh, was it Montana Dinosaur Center, whatever it is? That's yeah, up, yeah, um, yeah. Up in uh, Bynum. Um, that, that was yeah, that's really their cool. two medicine formation. They're hunting the same dinosaurs we are. Yeah, yeah, and they have a lot of really cool stuff. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. the same. Like, you're literally driving along the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And if you go north and then go west, you're right in Glacier National Park. Yeah. And it is just, we, we, we would stop at just the random parts on the side of the road and do like a photo shoot because it's like, there's the the rocky mountains are like your backdrop so <laughs> it's epic so that's for uh that's for fossils for artifacts uh that can really be anywhere i guess my favorite place is is southern arizona i love hunting in the desert because what's interesting about the desert is is it's all it's all on the surface because it's the desert. It doesn't have the built up of soil that we do back East or in other parts of the country. So you're walking along metal detecting in the desert and you can see a, you know, a button from the civil war right next to an arrowhead. That's 5,000 years old. And there's just something so cool about that. So when we metal detect, we'll keep our eye out for points and stuff like that. And, and so Southern Arizona is pretty awesome. We got to watch out for snakes and everything in the desert wants to stab, poke you, kill you, destroy you, you know, but other than, other than the pokey stabby stuff, it's a great place to, and bitey stuff. It's a great place to, to hunt for artifacts. So I, I love Southern Arizona for crystals and minerals. Uh, I'm going to have to go with East Tennessee and East Tennessee isn't a place that's really known for crystals and minerals, but we've got a really cool deposit of Herkimer diamonds. You, when you think of Herkimer diamonds, you don't think of, you know, East Tennessee, but I'm going to show you. Come with Douglas, me. We have Douglas. We, Douglas Lake diamonds. Yep, Douglas Herkimer, Lake, yep. We have Herkimer diamonds. Yes, we do. So this is my case. So here's, I don't know if the camera can see, but that is a Herkimer that I picked uh, up. Ah, that's a big one for Douglas. Holy shit. On the surface, and we've got the, you don't have to dig for him. You don't have to look, look at that. Yep. Look at that. Yeah. You don't have to dig that's for him. Cool. You don't have to, that's you cool. That's cool because I found some teeny, teeny straight ones. Up. Those are nice. Woo, so, look at that. Killer. So I like I like hunting for Herkimers uh yeah. in East Tennessee. So our yeah. reservoirs uh, they drop our reservoirs 50 feet every year. Oh, wow. Um, Douglas Lake in particular. It's 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 the first major water reservoir for the French Broad River. Um, 
which is a tributary of the Tennessee, which is a tributary of the Mississippi. So they drop it that much because it's, it's the first reservoir out of the mountains. So when it rains in the mountains or they get a lot of snow, they need it low to catch all that water. You know, sometimes I've seen the lake jump up 30 feet in a, in a day. Like it is nuts how quickly that, that lake can fill up. So they drop it 50 feet during the wintertime and you can go out there and you can walk and you can find these deposits of Herkimer diamonds. So our, our primary rock here is limestone and the limestone's totally eroded away. So you're hunting, you know, hunting these clay banks where the limestone once was and they're just, they're coming out of the clay. So they're really cool. I've got a, I've got a great honey hole uh, in, in, uh, on the lake bottoms that I go hunt. That's on private property that I have permission to go hunt. Uh, cause Douglas Lake is, is unlike the other rivers, unlike the other lakes. So Douglas Lake, the lake that's next to me, it's the only, it's the only lake in the TVA system that's set up like this. So they built the lake during World War II. It was the fastest dam ever built, I think, in U.S. history. Um, definitely, for sure, the TVA. Uh, they built it in nine months. This lake was built in 1942-43, and its purpose was to provide electricity for the Alcoa aluminum plant and for the secret city of Oak Ridge, where the Manhattan Project took place. And so they needed everybody off that land now. So what they did is, is the government said, look, we're just this is for the war effort. We're going to do a water easement. When the water goes back down, it's still your property. All right. So you can have a lake lot that has one acre above the lake, but your deed says 20 acres. Well, those 20 acres are under the water and the state only has an easement over over it when the water's above it. When it drops back down, private property and you can do what you want. So that's why it's the only lake in the system where you can go collect stuff and it's it's okay. So I've got a spot where landowner permission and I go hunt Herkimer diamonds and it's it's you just sit there and you pick them up. It's great. You're surface hunting for crystals. I mean how epic is and killer crystals. And we've got some citrine ones. We've got some amethyst ones that we'll find, which is I haven't I don't know what's going on there to cause that, but I found citrine, I found amethyst, I found smoky quartz. They've got killer, some of them have killer inclusions in them. Some of them get huge, you know, two and three inches big. But you know, the the same thing that's happening with those crystals is happening with fossils is you get the freeze thaw. Once they're exposed on the surface, water can get down in there and can expand it and break them into pieces. So that's another thing that the freeze thaw is destroying. So a lot of times you just find these big halves of, you know, crystals that were once whole. So, uh, I, so, so, so I had, yeah. to, I had, I had to double check it. Um, the Douglas dam um, was completed in February 19th of 1943. Mm -hmm. They had a four week long delay from flooding it only took them 382 days after construction oh, began, wow. and it is a world record for a project of that size. That's I mean, cool. It's a, it's I didn't know it was lake. that quick. Yeah. It's a big lake. Yeah. So it's, just it's over, a huge 500 yeah. and something miles of coastline, I think. Does it say on Wikipedia? It's a lot of coastline. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've been there, and I, I, I mean, it just it blew me away. Like, I, you know, I come from the Great Lakes where, you know, it's, <sighs> naturally made so you know i was like wow this is this is incredible yeah it's it's, the the lake itself is over twenty eight thousand acres it's a big lake um, yeah it is it's great huge. it's one of the top 10 bass lakes in the country uh it's right on the edge of the mountains it's it's gorgeous but there's you know you can go find stuff um you know th there were some there were once uh on the lakes so that flooded the french broad river valley which was the like I said this was the first this was the first entrance of water out into the Tennessee Valley and so there was there's a lot of prehistoric uh, history that yeah. or was it's on those lake bottoms and those sites are sadly completely gone the raising and lowering of the water over the past 50 years have taken all the topsoil off took it down to bare clay and those sites sadly are completely destroyed completely gone um you know so i'll say uh, as somebody who's an outsider who looked at research <clears throat> to come in because i did some prospecting out there um in the like the last year and yeah like seeing what 
what's researched and out there and then going out there and visually seeing it's definitely changed. So like it, it, you could see it a definite change just from what, what you can read online from years ago from now, like it, there's a definite change and you can see the layer change just as an outsider. So I can imagine for somebody who lives there can see it. Well, just and, look at the rock exposure. I mean, there, there are limestone outcroppings that were once under dirt that are now completely exposed, like that are 10 feet up, you know, 10 feet high. So. Yeah. So it, it does say Douglas Lake has an average 500 miles of shoreline and an average surface area of nearly 300,000 acres. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a big it's, lake. I mean, it's, it's a, a big, big lake. It's crazy. Yeah. A buddy of mine, uh, and he wa we were talking about doing it with uh, for Douglas. A uh, buddy of mine, we actually we did a, an episode, one of the early episodes of our YouTube channel. We did it with uh, David Dean, who he's passed away now, but he did a lot of archaeological work for the state of Tennessee. And he did an archaeological project for the state and for TVA on Boone Lake, where he would walk the shoreline and identify previously unknown prehistoric Native American sites. He found something like 300 unknown prehistoric sites. And so we were talking about doing that to Douglas and walking the shoreline to see what sites we can identify that nobody ever knew existed. And that work still needs to be done and can be done, you know, at least to get the sites logged and recorded because you know, there are sites in random places where you would not think there would be a site there anywhere. But because of all the raising and lowering and everything's exposed, you can see the flint, you can see the point, you can see everything. So you can see the fire cracked rocks, the evidence of fireplaces, the whole, the whole shebang. So, you know, there's there, there and that and see, that's what's so cool about history is because mm -hmm. we think that it's all been discovered we think yeah. that it's all been understood we think that it's all known and that's not true i mean dude 300 sites is nothing to sneer at uh you can watch the episode <laughs> go to our youtube channel um and and see it for yourself you know and you can see the work that he did um there's still stuff out there to discover there's still stuff out there to learn there's still stuff out there to to figure out and you know set citizen science where it's not very prevalent in this country anymore at least towards history you don't see much citizen science in the fossil world or in the archaeological world you do in natural history but you don't you know like bugs and plants and stuff like that but we need some of that citizen science within these disciplines you know in order to help further our understanding so yeah. basically you people out there watching this and on the interwebs Get, go find what's cool to find in your own area and help out science. Like there's yeah. stuff to find. You just got to go, go find it. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, I'm just looking through. We've gotten we have, a ton of Yeah. Comments. I was looking at comments too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there's yeah, there's so there's a much. lot of a lot of comments. That's so many questions. There's just a lot of people like just wanting to share their piece. Yeah, yeah and I want to say too, like it's it's really great to see, like you've got this really awesome artifact and rock mineral, even meteorites, even yeah. Um, and you do buy quite a bit of stuff, but like a ton of your work that you do, you're finding it yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you're just not sitting like I, I almost picture like someone that's got a lot of money that just like goes around and they're like, yeah, I'm going to buy this and this. And you're in the dirt digging through yeah. old cisterns and you're breaking rocks to I get, you know, some of this stuff like, yeah. It's well, just, I it's love this, really too. Good. I mean, I'm truly passionate about it. And I mean, I I grew up finding stuff, you know, and so it's, you know, I so I, I've got a shop so that I get to go find stuff. That's the whole point. I get to, you know, it, it, it funds, you know, chasing history and it funds the ability for me to go out and find new stuff. And I love that, but you got to keep in mind, I'm not finding everything. A lot of the stuff that's in the shop comes from men and women who every day put their boots on and go hunt this stuff themselves. There are whole communities out there. You brought up meteorites. So there's communities out there of people. That's all they do is nerd out and go find meteorites. All right. So there are those communities out there. There are communities that go out all day, every day and hunt for crystals. 
groups that go out and metal detect for Civil War relics, groups that go out and look for dinosaur fossils, groups that go out. And, and so all of these little communities, I've been really fortunate to meet incredible people in all of these groups, become friends, learn how they do it, dig alongside them, purchase some of the stuff that they find, you know, and, and find some stuff myself and you know, work with these groups in all these different areas to kind of bring it all together in one place to create this madhouse that is right. the relic room. But, you know, there's, and that's one thing people don't get is that you can make a living hunting dinosaurs. You can, you can right now make a living hunting dinosaurs, you know, you just got to get permission from the landowner and go out and put in the work and you can do it. You can make a living digging crystals. You know, you've either got to buy a site or get permission and go out and do the work. Same with meteorites, same with metal detect, same with all of this. You know, you right. can make a living doing that. So there's a lot of great people out there that that do this. So it's not just me. I'm I'm standing with a bunch, I mean hundreds of incredible men and women that are passionate, that are hardworking, that are incredibly knowledgeable, that go out and do this stuff for a living also. So, you know, it, it would not be possible without them. And like I said, I, I've I've made the best friends in the world doing this like man i love my people <laughs> so much I, I feel they the are just way. so cool yeah it's, it's very it's incredible when you find your people it really really is yeah yeah and i'm really lucky i, I found some good people doing this so yeah yeah okay well so let's go through let's see uh, is there any more questions before we, you know, get to the end of the, this episode? Is there, if there, if you've got some questions and you're watching, throw yeah, them anybody, in. Throw yeah. some questions out. Yeah. I like answering questions. Uh, uh, let's see. Or comments or insults. I take insults <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> so, so just while we're, while we're waiting to, um, you can look up more Chase's um, videos as Chasing History, and The Relic Room is um, what you can also look up um, on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube. All, all the socials. Yeah, just uh, Google Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Well, we have our own YouTube. We're, one thing that we're doing now is um, uh, we've got a really great new director of media marketing, and uh, Isaac Ward, who hopped on there a few minutes ago and said hello, um, he's doing a fantastic job. We're, we're doing a lot of really short, um, five minute, one minute, 30 second little educational blips. We're producing an incredible amount of content, all educational based where we're throwing them on the Smoky Mountain Knife Works is, or Knife Works, Smoky Mountain Relic Rooms YouTube channel. Uh, we're throwing stuff on Chasing History on our YouTube channel. We're throwing stuff on our TikTok. We're throwing stuff on our Instagram. We're throwing stuff all out there in the world. So it's definitely worth, you know, going and subscribing and following because, you know, we're throwing something, you know, I've, I've got footage for years that we're, pirating and throwing out there and so if just for a minute you want to see some really cool stuff uh go on to any of our social medias follow along and i promise you you'll see some great content on our tiktok we do giveaways once a week we do a once a week live this way oh. we gave away like a hundred dollars worth of stuff nice. so you know we we give away some good stuff like a, a shark jaw a really killer piece of vivianite i gave away uh, and a tooth that was today's giveaway so yeah oh chris newman hey what's up dude yeah he went out uh, metal detecting with us once out in arizona that was that was a lot of fun yes so <clears throat> oh, and, and mike mentions oh um, yeah do you do you have uh fossil invertebrates like trilobites oh yeah Oh, gosh, I got a whole trilobite case. <laughs> so I've got trilobites from the United States and all over. So I've, I've got nice. tons of tons. There's really nothing in, in history that you can name or come up with. I actually like playing that game when we do our TikToks live. It's like come up with a culture or a time period of something you want to see something from. And nine times out of ten, we've got it. So, and, and, and I love that because that means I got something for everybody. No matter what you nerd out on, I'm going to have something cool for you to nerd out. On. Uh, 
it's so. Like so exciting like literally like just thinking about like okay so what, what do you have what can i learn like it's exciting <laughs> yeah well and it you know and and if you want to take it home and collect it you can and you can afford it you know not to bring it back to that whole aspect but dude every this stuff yes. isn't it's not rare you can collect it you can afford it you can take care of it you can go find it you just got to get out there and do it. I mean, how long has rock hounding been around for? Really, if you think about it as a hobby, 50s, 60s, really 70s. That's not a very, that's not a hobby that's been around for a long time. No. So there's still tons of stuff to go find. You know, same with metal detecting, 70s, some in the 60s, mostly 70s. Fossil collecting, 70s, 80s. These aren't old hobbies. We're still at the birth of a whole industry. Yeah. Birth. Uh, like, like we're, we're are, literally on, uh, in the birth of it. Yes. Like, so, like, this is like the beginning of like so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so what's great is, is you guys can get in on the ground floor. You guys out there watching can get in on the ground floor and be a part of it. You can yes. be a collector. You can make a living going and doing this. I've got friends that do it every single day. And yeah, I know I, you guys I, do too. I, I think there's a lot because um, I've followed some um, uh, like other pocket like a uh, April Volke does a podcast called um, Anchored, which is mostly focused on like fly fishing. But she does all sorts of other outdoor stuff, which is really cool. And, you know, she I remember one of the episodes she had on some people that were doing like foraging and, you know, mm -hmm. doing classes and things like that. And they said, I love foraging. They, That's so much fun. Yeah. So they've seen just such an expanse of people mm. interested in it yeah and i think a lot of it is coming you know like with gardening um rock hunting like so much is people wanting to get things from the source where they know where it's coming from and know what's yeah. put into it and then also just being able to have a physical connection to the outside where right now we're do i mean what are we doing right now like we're on our phones we're on our computers we're you know doing these things virtually and people are sort of looking for these outlets to get out and do the physical things and be with the earth which people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years and i think that's one of the reasons why you start to see some of this you know rock hounding sort of get popular now is people mm -hmm. are looking for things that they it doesn't cost any money you mm -hmm. can go out and walk around and find fossils artifacts crystals wherever and you don't necessarily need anything at most you might need a hammer um, take your dad's other, hammer don't right. ask him, but take your dad's hammer. <laughs> Don't lose it. Yeah. So, and I, I think that that kind of just kind of speaks to like how, as it's sort of a pendulum, as the world shifts to so much of a digital age, people are really going the other way and saying, Yeah, I want to get outside. What can I do? And this is such a cool thing that you learn the history of the earth, of the people, of everything. And like I've said before, it's like treasure hunting. You go out and you might find I something know, that's right? worth something. <laughs> it's so cool. You know, and well, and a big part of that is, is what you guys are doing. The outreach that you guys are doing, what you're doing, what you guys are doing is a, is a huge, hugely important. You're putting out there on the web and on, on podcast form that you're showing people you're introducing the world to people that do this for a living, the people that that have figured out how to go do this. And yeah. that's hugely important because most of America doesn't know you can go do this. Oh, my they God. Have no clue. They have no freaking so clue. Like, how no cool idea. this shit is? This shit and is so cool. I know. And some people are like, Shh, don't tell. Don't, what the fuck? No. Don't tell people. But anti gatekeeper. anti gatekeeper. But what you guys are doing is hugely important because you're putting out there, you know, here is a new person every week and they rock hound and you can go rock hound too. And that is so important to building this up because, I mean, have you ever really heard of anybody that's into any of this that's like a crackhead? I mean, not <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I, we, we all know somebody, but but you know what I, I mean. When yeah. you have yeah, a like, healthy hobby like that, like this, yeah. you you well, have a healthy yeah, lifestyle. I've, yeah, I, I've I've heard I've I've heard of some people that 
have rock shops in the areas of people trying to get money and they know of some, you know, they'll trespass in the pits, try to get things and sell yeah, them for inflated for money. things. But on, and we have a lot other... of people who are trying to get out of that. Like they're trying to mentally get away from like drugs and alcohol and come into the hobby to it's a right. Hobby. Hob. right, right. And then that's, right. that's what I was hobby. Yes. Heck yeah. Right. You, you yeah. got it, Ben. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was going to say is, you know, and then there's the whole other end of people that, you know, they they found a hobby <clears throat> that, you know, it's it's really you get out of it what you put into it. If you do the research, if you put the time in, if you put the effort in, you will get so much more out of it. And yeah. it will teach you more about like yourself and self-esteem and hard work and, you know, all of these things that can help lift you out of, you know, some of these yeah. bad places that you might be. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. one of those things that I've, I, I think I mentioned maybe in the last episode that, you know, I've talked with people that, you know, they've, they've listened to some of these episodes and they go, you know, this hobby seems to almost attract people that might have, you know, depression or some of these other issues. And it's not so much that it's the people are falling into this because it's a deeper, darker hole. It's a thing that can help lift you out of it. Yeah, where you're getting outside. That's right you're you're and this too like the community is so nice like if you go to a rock or mineral yeah. club like <clears throat> meeting and you talk to people and go hey like i like calcite crystals and agates and whatever and everyone's like well so do i oh where do you go oh you know whatever like i've never met someone at any of those meetings or you know even like a rock shop talking to some random person or the store owner or whoever who's going to try to put someone down or will you know be unreasonable about anything and people want to help and expand yeah, they um, want to share just, they want to share yeah. information they want they want you to be successful in this like they want you to find that like we want to give you info and we want you to find it like we want you to have that feeling that we had when we found it like that's and great. that's true for that's true for every genre so whether it's metal detecting artifact hunting fossil digging it's all every genre I have found that it's exactly that people wanting to help other people out and include them in the hobby and get them interested and get them started and get them out there hunting and finding stuff. That's what's so great about about this history thing that we do yeah. is we're all passionate about it. And we all like to share it. We all love to see people get excited about it. Yeah. So it's dude, it's it's that's the sure as crap beat selling insurance. And then and let me tell you something. Let me and I just want to just add this little tiny little thing because I know we're getting till the end. But this weekend, like having the opportunity to dig with somebody who's like in their sixties plus, like I think he's Amos is sixty five, who like started loving this hobby at the age of seven, like over fifty some years ago, who like felt alone in this hobby, loving finding things you know that no one else cared about because farmers are like get these rocks and gems or whatever out of my way because i can't grow what i need to grow and be like whoa, whoa, whoa this is beautiful how did it how did it grow? how did this develop and da -da 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 -da. And, and and to see that passion grow and develop and to be 50 some years later and still have that same passion about earth and nature and connecting people to that it's like yeah. oh my god like those people are like what we need you know and to to see those people and the impact that they can have on others it's like how could there be a better hobby <laughs> it's no, like, there isn't. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, and, and it's and it's something too that you know we we have interviewed you know chase started finding artifacts when he was five or six and amos started yeah. when he was seven and I've met and talked to people that they're in their 20s or 30s or, or however old. And they're like, you know, yeah, like I was kind of into, you know, maybe I picked up rocks as a kid and whatever. But now they're kind of like, hey, yeah. I kind of want to look more into this because I've got yeah. more time. I've got, you know, maybe just the desire now or whatever it is. And it's definitely a hobby that it's like you don't have to be a kid to no, become an expert no. at it like this isn't the <laughs> nfl or you know nba or yeah anything like no you, you have to be the in. best player ever <laughs> right no. right like it's 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 a hobby that you can pick up right now without any experience 
and learn and <clears throat> go out and find just amazing things and just open up a whole world of whole world. possibilities and history and science and just everything else that you you know maybe you weren't you know just curious about but like it's it's out there and all you need to do is just go for it right well i guarantee you where whoever's watching this wherever you're watching this i guarantee you 100 percent that within driving distance is a rock and mineral club i yeah. guarantee you that within driving distance there's a metal detecting club i guarantee you within driving distance there's a fossil club google your st- Whatever your freaking hometown is, home county, part of your state, you know, that, you know, eastern Idaho, whatever, you know, type it out. Fossil club, rock club, metal detecting club. Or or just real quick, like even if you're in an inner city and you're like, this shit is so cool and I'm surrounded by buildings and I want to be connected to my nature. Just Google the the, the next place near you. Yeah. yeah, and what you'll and, find and if it, you go if you go to amfed.org, that's um all the that's the American Federation of Mineralogical Societies, amfed a m f e d dot org. They've got a list of all the clubs in the United States that are affiliated with them. They've even got yes. a map now that you can use to look for it, and nice. it's just it's such an amazing resource. So um, if you're interested at all and you're not part of a mineral club yet. And just a reminder, you can be a part of a mineral club even if you aren't in that area. So, yes. for instance, mm-hmm. the Minnesota Mineral Club that I'm in, we Zoom all of our meetings. We have people that attend our field trips from all over the U.S. Um, and you don't have to join just one. You can join multiple. multiple. We, I've known plenty of people that are in multiple clubs. So don't think that. I live in Ohio. I'm in the Minnesota Mineral Club. And I'm going to join like the one with Amos in the South Carolina <laughs> Mineral Club. Like you can join all of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you'll and get newsletters you'll and people. and Yeah. What you'll find in these clubs is, is you'll find a lot of people, a lot of older people that have done this for 50 years that love sharing their knowledge. They want to teach you everything. They want to teach you. (laughs) They will like grab you and go, come with me to my site and I'm going to show you how to do this. That's what's so great about those clubs. And no matter where you are in the country, if you have an interest in some part of history, there's a club where there are people there to help you out and show you, show you the way. So you can go yeah, learn I, all about the force. Yeah, there there was a time um, <laughs> when I went to Montana to go look for agates, and I went oh, at the wrong Montana time. Agates. And the all the rivers, all my spots were blown out. I that was all underwater, and I was like, "What do I do?" So I emailed the Billings Rock and Gem Club, whatever it's called, and I said, "Hey, like I'm actually a part of another club. I'm out here, all my spots or whatever." the 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 person that was the president of the i don't know if it was amfed or american lands association uh doug true um who actually wrote an article about he was amazing i i was like hey i'm out here you know do you have some spots like whatever he offered and took me to a spot for bear canyon agates that no one had known about that he took me in his truck to go out there (laughs) he didn't just say he didn't just say you know hey here's a gps spot oh you could go look for fossils here or whatever he took me out there and it's something that has stuck with me and that i've wanted to pass on where if there is someone that emails like our minnesota mineral club i get all the emails of people that are like hey i'm traveling for work i'm from north dakota i don't know where to go where are some spots and i can go hey here's some spots you know whatever and it's really just a part of this community where all you need to do is just get it start getting involved um and a lot of these mineral clubs just to say this from experience and i'm sure a lot of the other clubs too are the same way we need volunteers yeah we need the people that are passionate and want to help out and will want to volunteer to keep those clubs in in business to keep them going because these clubs don't function without volunteers and you might think you're not qualified but you know we need webmasters we need people to take minutes at meetings you know whatever it is and it's so easy to get involved and it's so rewarding to think that you're a part of a club that is providing a service to people where, you know, mm-hmm. we, we will talk to school groups, Boy Scout groups, whatever. We yeah. put out, you know, a whole bunch of information. We take people on field trips um, at our meetings, you know, talking to people. There's there's a member that I bought a rock saw from that I'm now like, hey, like my rock saw is having issues. The blade is bending. Something's off on it. 
And he's like, hey, I can come up and show you and help you and, you know, fix it for you. Like, this is the kind of stuff that you can't just get from, like, watching a random YouTube video of right. someone going, how is my saw not working or whatever? Right. Like, these are the people that are part of a community. They want to help you. They want to support other people that you really just can't get without being a part of. So and I, I just want to and I just want to add one little thing is that like, you know, people watching this as a woman of color, like I just want to let people know, like this is a very inviting community as as a woman of color, like I'm heading this podcast. And so like, <clears throat> you know, my mission is to let people know like this this is something that like I got pulled into, like, you know, I was in a dark place, you know, we've talked this in the past on the podcast, you know, uh, and shows and in previous episodes, you know, like I found this hobby through my daughter and, and, you know, everybody in 2020, you know, where they go through their thing with dark times. And, you know, this, this hobby has pulled me into a better place in my life. And, being as a, a woman of color, you know, you're like, hmm, there's not very many people around here that look like me. Um, but yet, you know, I have always felt, I've always felt ex accepted and have never had any issues. Like I would have maybe have had in other aspects in life. So this is a hobby that's very, very accepting, inviting, more than just you would expect in normal life. Like it, it's almost like people kind of leave things at the door and it's like, you like nature, you like rocks, you like this, like, okay, you're my people. So it's, it's just one of those kind of hobbies where you're just not, it's unexpected in kind of a way. I, I don't know how to describe it, but with that, it makes it so much more special to you. So it's, it's, obviously very special to me personally and 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 i that's something that i really want to portray and and really share with others you know so that they can be more connected and and be more involved so well, I, have I just want i just want to add that piece you know as someone different than the other two people that are on the show that that you know you know because you're listening and you're watching you're like okay well you know they're saying this and that but i don't look like them i don't i don't have those experiences well you know like through me like i've had those experiences and i can tell you that this is this is just something different than you would expect so just like dive in no, it's that's a really good point that you make. I mean, because you know these clubs are very accepting of everybody because we're all bonded by the same interest. It doesn't matter who you are, what sex right. you are, what color you are, any of that. You love, if, dude. You love history and you love finding stuff and you love nerding out on this stuff, dude. You're you're my person. Like, oh my come, god, let's, yes. Let's go. Let's go hang out and find some stuff and nerd out on this and learn and the whole nine yards. That's what's so cool about about you know these history hunting communities, not just rocks and minerals, but you know metal detectors or meteorite hunters or whatever. You know, it's all about you know it's the common bond of going and finding cool old stuff. Yeah, and the love for sharing that in these communities is you just you, there's no other hobby where you find it. You know, you don't, you don't find that in, you know, collecting baseball cards or, right. you know, you know, whatever other yeah. hobbies that are out there, you really see it in, in, in these history related you, hobbies. You, you truly do. Yes. Well, yeah. um, we've gone on for way <laughs> over. <laughs> Which by the way, I totally warned you that like this episode was going to be a long one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, and it was it was great. This was definitely something that I was excited for, and we're so happy to have you on. So, well, thank um, you thank guys you so again. much. Like I said, I really appreciate and value what you guys do. I mean, you guys are doing the outreach that you know this world needs. You know, we need good podcasts. We need a good platform where you know you guys have created a great platform where i mean I've, I've watched your show for you know a while and seen your guest and know a couple of them and dude you guys have had some awesome guests on here and the questions that you ask are really thought-provoking and really in-depth and so i'm so grateful to to be asked to be to be on here because you know you guys need to keep doing what you're doing because this is how people find out you know by watching you know, or listening to podcasts like this. This is how people find out that you that you can go do this stuff. 
And so what you guys do is incredibly valuable. And I am just thankful to be to be asked. So thank you guys for what you all do. And keep it up. Don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> yes. There's yes. other we, people out there. Go yes. to them. <laughs> and we are definitely going to keep going. And if you want to follow us, we are on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. And if you for whatever reason, need the audio only podcast version of this. We are on anywhere you can find a podcast, Spotify, Apple podcasts, any of those. Um, you can look for us. Um, usually I've got these posted every Sunday after they are live. Um, so you can watch out for that. And <clears throat> speaking of episodes, um, we will be taking a slight break and our next episode will be on April 17th. Um, same time, 845 Eastern, and it's going to be Dave Verabioff, uh, who is a gold mine owner and also a miner. And by the way, if you do know Dave, you do know Dave is like crazy energy. Like he is like probably one of the coolest gold miners ever. So like this is an episode that you definitely want to watch. But I just want yes, to say Yes, yes. And uh, we are going to have a whole bunch of updates after that. Um, so make sure... Get your eclipse glasses ready because this will oh, be yes! after the eclipse. Yes! I'm going to be down yeah. in, in Arkansas mining some quartz. So it's going <clears> to <throat> be a, a great episode. So um, yes. make sure to tune in for that. Yes, definitely. So uh, thanks again, Chase, for. Yes, thank you, Chase. All of your, your, your you time guys. and just everything. So make sure to follow Chasing History in the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Yeah. And um, if you're not a subscriber to Rock Hound Talk Live, definitely subscribe to us on YouTube, Rock Hound Talk Live. We are the only live Rock Hound podcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and hopefully TikTok soon. So definitely uh, subscribe to us so that you can get notifications when we go live on Wednesday nights at 845 Eastern Standard Time. And with that, um, thanks everyone for watching and listening tonight and hope you'll have a good night. All Remember, right, everyone. guys, history rocks. Woo! Peace out. <laughs> <laughs>